Today is Friday, November 3rd, 2017. This is Hannah Crawford. I am interviewing Dr. Manish Patel in the broadcast studios of CDC in Atlanta. Mr. Todd Jordan is our studio engineer and videographer. Dr. Patel was the director for the Task Force for Global Health Support Team to the IMG, where he was seconded in 2013 for the Center for Global Health at the CDC. His team provided technical and programmatic support to GPI partners and countries implementing the polio end game. Mm -hmm. um, and today we'll be discussing your firsthand experiences in providing um, and planning the support with special focus on the switch from mm -hmm. trivalent to bivalent vaccine. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I guess to begin, makes sense to go ahead and record your verbal consent. Do we have your consent to interview you and record it? Uh, yes. Great, thanks. Um, so if you would begin by introducing yourself by name, um, say where and when you were born and share a little bit about your early life and family. Uh, so my name is Manish Patel. I was born in India, Calcutta, India. Uh, where my mother was raised and brought up. Uh, and I was raised in Bombay, where my family lived, my dad's side of the family lived. And I grew up in India for, I spent my first 12 years of my life there. And then my family got up and moved to the US. So I moved here when I was around 12 years of age. We moved uh, to multiple places, Chicago, then California for a couple of years, and then ended up settling in Arkansas. Um, where my father found a business, a small business. And so I spent most of my time uh, as a teenager in Arkansas in high school and college, medical school. I would love to hear a little bit about your educational history. Yeah, so as I said, I, uh, most of my time was in Arkansas with regard to high school, college, and medical school. Uh, I'm in college, during college, I majored in chemistry and subsequent to that, uh, applied to medical school, for, was fortunate enough to get in. I think the grand plan for me probably was always to go to medical school. I don't think I had actually thought otherwise. I don't know. Uh, since a, at a young age, I was uh, always, I think, pretty decent in the sciences, and I don't think I'd showed interest in anything else. So, you know, I think around me, family members, parents, you know, I'd always sort of I mean, assumed that I was going to do something. And then I think, again, stereotyping, you know, we're expected to be either doctors or engineers, not minimizing other professions, but I think, you know, that's sort of the highest, the bar is set to that level. And so I'd always assumed that I would go into medicine, and I don't think I'd even thought otherwise in college. Shows probably my narrow-mindedness. <laughs> so from chemistry to medicine, I think, you know, chemistry was a means of getting into medical school, and chemistry is what I was interested in most uh, as a subject matter as opposed to biology or physics. What brought you to emergency medicine? Why did you choose of all the different areas of medicine? It's interesting to me that you chose emergency medicine. Yeah, again, probably another random decision that sort of put me down, you know, this path. It was not premeditated by any means. Uh, and actually, you know, I, I think I, th I wanted to be a surgeon. I thought I was gonna be a surgeon. Um, you know, you go through medical school, as you all know, through various different um, um, rotations in clinical specialties during your third year. And some folks have an idea because of their past exposure, they've done research, they have family members, mentors. I had none of that. Uh, so I was pretty open-minded uh, in general. And, you know, every specialty, I was, the, I was the guy who wanted to be that, you know, specialty. I wanted to enter that specialty. You know, started out with OBGYN, and I loved it. I mean, I thought I would be a obstetrician. I mean, I enjoyed really, you know, uh, delivering uh, babies and you know the healthcare to women and all other aspects related to that. Then I entered another, you know, general surgery, and I loved it. And so I loved pretty much every profession, even psychiatry. I truly enjoyed, you know, yeah. So I think you know, I was just one of those guys who enjoyed uh, every different uh, specialty. And then for some reason, uh, when I, in fourth year, I did emergency medicine, I just absolutely loved it. And I think to bring the story to a close, I think all those specialties, you pretty much see every aspect of uh, each one of those specialties in the emergency department. 
And then also, you know, I think personally, I, I, emergency medicine tends to be a safety net for a lot of, uh, a fair amount of our population. And so you see a lot of patients you don't typically see in clinic or in the other specialties because they use emergency medicine as their, and I really, that connected with me. And so providing care to, you know, the destitute, the homeless, the impoverished, people who don't have primary care providers, you know, that really, uh, I connected with that. And so I changed uh, course during my fourth year and applied to emergency medicine. I don't yeah. know if that's too much for you probably, but. <laughs> no, that was great. So from emergency medicine, you came to Rollins? Uh, from emergency medicine, I did a fellowship in uh, San Francisco at UCSF. So right around, you know, it, when I entered emergency medicine, by at that point, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a clinician, but I also uh, enjoyed doing research a lot. I was exposed during my residency so it's a three-year residency, and I spent time in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and that specific residency, within emergency medicine, emergency medicine is a very clinical specialty. It's a young specialty among specialties. I think, uh, of course, emergency medicine has been around for a long time, but as an organized specialty, uh, it, it was, I think, in the late 70s or early 70s is when it was formed. And... Um, so compared to other uh, uh, well-established specialties, uh, you know, they were, there was not as much of an academic component to it. Majority of them provide clinical service. And even within academic institutions, they are the providers of clinical care. And so research is very uh, immature within the emergency medicine field compared to other specialties. Uh, this specific residency program, which again, I didn't recognize that, uh, tended to be research heavy and, you know, uh, amongst the specialties. And that, you know, again, exposed me to uh, research in general and the contributions to research, uh, to clinical care, to, you know, the practice of emergency medicine in general. So I knew with very early on within emergency medicine that I wanted to do research of some sort, <laughs> aspirational goal. Uh, for, so from there, that's why I chose to do a fellowship at UCSF in pharmacology and experimental therapeutics. What does that mean? Uh, it's essentially, you know, looking at, uh, we, we give drugs as doctors, as patients, we take drugs. It, traditionally, we have not understood the effects of those drugs really well. So it essentially looks at all aspects of clinical pharmacology. How do the drugs make it under a system? What's the right dose? Uh, what are the effects? What are the adverse events? You know, all aspects as a specialty. And we, everyone learns that in medical school uh, to a certain extent, but very few people focus on that, you know, and then bridging the sort of the basic science aspect to the clinical side. And so it's been rel relatively, uh, 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 siloed field um, within pharmacology and uh, the field of pharmacy in general, but there hasn't been a great bridge, or you know, uh, uh, to clinical medicine. So I really enjoyed toxicology, and you know, that took me to San Francisco, which offered this program. That's great. Uh, and so interestingly, uh, Dr. Gerberding, Julie Gerberding, who was the director of CDC, did the same fellowship you know, a number of years before me, which <laughs> I learned after I came to CDC. <laughs> That's interesting. Cool. Um, so drawing from what you've already shared and maybe adding to it, uh -huh. how did all of these experiences prepare you or bring you to global health in Atlanta and then into polio? Yeah, and as I said, I think it wasn't planned to even come to Atlanta or to Polio, but uh, certainly I think the experiences, I don't know if I've consciously thought about how they've helped, but certainly, I mean, how I've been trained and how I've come here I mean, within emergency medicine, I big functional what we do is triage. Poison Control Center, even more so. I mean, we really help, you know, parents who call us in the middle of the night, hey, I took two pills as opposed to one. You can stay at home or you go to the emergency. And that is immensely valuable. And how do you come to that experience it's really by seeing a hundred of those in the past? And, you know, I, you don't expect a parent to know that or even a physician working in the ER ha 
himself might not have seen that many overdoses with that one. So when you're concentrated in the specialty, you might see 100 of those patients and you might be able to provide that experience. So you triage a lot, very, you know, very rapidly, very fast, and very uh, confidently, I would say. Not very confident, just confidently. Uh, and so I think you know, that, that skill has helped me quite a bit as, as I've uh, gotten here, is to be able to uh, triage what's important, what's urgent, what's unimportant. Um, you know, uh, coming to a meeting, sort of getting a sense for, you know, which part of our objectives that we come out of the meeting is important that I should follow up on versus what is stuff that can, you know, uh, wait. wait. And so that's been quite important, I think, within polio itself and within the end game. There was a lot and a lot of uh, activities, a lot of pressure from many different partners, from countries. There's lots of um, uh, things to do. <laughs> and then prioritizing within that, uh, I think, uh, is something I've probably learned over the years in other specialties. Let's go ahead and jump into the end game mm -hmm. since you it came up. Um, how did you come to be a part of the end game? Um, and yeah, I guess if you can continue as we're talking to mm -hmm. bring in some of some of the skills that transferred mm -hmm. from other parts of your background, that would be good too. Uh, yes, sure, sure. So, how did I come into the end game? Well, I worked uh, within CDC. I had uh, before coming to the polio. I'd spent ten years at CDC, ten, eleven, twelve years maybe, and a fair amount of that time was working in vaccine preventable diseases in a, a small little silo known as rotavirus. Rotavirus is uh, the most common cause of diarrhea amongst kids under five everywhere, from, you know, cleanest places in the world, such as Japan, to, you know, some of the most uh, uh, impoverished areas of the world, you know, kills half of the kids who uh, get diarrhea, who die from diarrhea, are killed by rotavirus. So it's you know a very common cause of death in kids, at least was, prior to the introduction of a vaccine or several vaccines. And uh, so I worked in that field uh, looking at the epidemiologic aspects of the disease and then the vaccine itself. Uh, and the vaccine is, has some unique challenges, uh, not unlike polio, uh, in efficacy challenges, how well it works, as well as some safety challenges, you know, some of the adverse effects related to. So I worked uh, in that uh, uh, and was quite versed with introduction of uh, rotavirus vaccines. So rotav rotav vaccines came out, uh, were licensed, uh, the current ones, in 2006. At that time, uh, you know, uh, there was a huge uh, increase in uh, new vaccines that are being recommended and introduced worldwide. Traditionally, there have been the six big vaccines uh, in the API program for the past three, four decades. And uh, there are still coverage issues, particularly in areas where kids are dying or uh, have disability from deaths. We haven't had high coverage of those six vaccines. And then on top of that, you have all these new vaccines, newer vaccines, you could say, rotavirus, pneumococcal vaccines, HPV. Um, and to help facilitate those introductions, there was this group set up called Gavi, the Gavi Alliance. Um, and, and could you say the acronym just so we have it? Yeah, and Gavi is now just Gavi. I think uh, they're so big and so famous and so popular that they've decided to go, you know, the first Gabby, name only. As yeah. the prince. Um, I think it was Global Alliance for Vaccines uh, and Immunizations, maybe, when it started out. Uh, uh, yeah, but now it's the Gavi Alliance. And essentially, it is an alliance of uh, you know donors and partners and stakeholders and uh, all of them. And, uh, you know, and they've done an immensely wonderful job of increasing support for these new vaccine introductions in the most impoverished nations so that have the highest burden of disease. The reason I was mentioning this is there are challenges to getting traditional vaccines into these uh, uh, impoverished countries. And so the rotavirus and pneumococcal, which tend to be new vaccines, have even more challenges getting them in. They're expensive. 
they have unique challenges, and uh, the countries haven't really bought into the fact that why do we need uh, you know additional vaccines? So, uh, uh, so there's a whole host of challenges to getting these vaccines into programs, and that's how I got into Endgame. I had received a call from uh, uh, some folks at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, very very early stage before uh, the IMG, which uh, facilitated the Endgame, was formed. Um, to uh, seek my interest in helping out uh, with the introduction process. You know, what have you guys learned from these new vaccine introductions with rotavirus specifically with these countries? And translate that to the end game. And one of the major aspects of the end game itself is introduction of IPV, inactivated polio vaccine. Uh, and uh, same issues with IPV, although it's an old vaccine, it's a new vaccine for the countries. And so same challenges exist from financial issues to, you know, the actual logistical issues to decision-making issues to countries. Why do we need another vaccine? Why do we need that? Why can't we just use the old, old OPV uh, in the face of all these existing, you know, uh, priorities that we have in country? <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> No, you're, you're very welcome. So to make a long story short, uh, it essentially the reason for my, uh, my initial, uh, uh, initially why I think they approached me was to see what we can bring from rotavirus vaccine introduction and new vaccine introduction in general to IPV. And around what year was that? Uh, it was right around end of 2012, I believe. Because you moved over in 2013. Correct. Yeah, it was about a six to eight month sort of, you know, period. Um, what do you remember about how the connection was made with Gates? Did they contact you because they were familiar with the work you had been doing? Was it on someone's <laughs> recommendation? Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think I went too much into the other stories. I mean, we were part of the rotavirus vaccine introduction was working very closely with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with the Gavi Alliance, WHO, with the countries, and Rota at CDC is a small group of people started, you know, with by uh, famous epidemiologist, Dr. Roger Glass, and his protege, Dr. Amish Parshar. And so it's a small group of people where everyone knows everyone. And uh, CDC has had a huge footprint globally in that disease, um, specifically with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the reason I mentioned them is, you know, I think Rota vaccines were, as I understand it, was one of the impetus for um, Mr. Bill Gates to be uh, to be involved with uh, just global health in general. I think he had first, you know, the, right, had, he had not recognized rotavirus was the leading killer. And there was vaccines that were potentially available at the time when he was involved. So I want to I want to target a higher level of detail. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first contact that you had? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the gentleman from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation contact, I think that's what you're referring to, mm -hmm. contacted me, Apurva Malayala. He was a project officer within the polio group there. And I think at the time, again, you know, it was a very high level thinking of how should we implement the end game. And essentially the end game is introduction of IPV and the switch. And there are some other aspects as well, strengthening routine immunizations. Uh, and so they were really strategizing, what's it gonna take to introduce IPV in these 121 countries in a matter of two to three years? which has never, ever been done before. That was their main goal. And I think they had extrapolated some uh, experiences from these other new vaccine introductions. What can we learn? How did Rota, which had not even come close to introducing that many in that many countries over 10 years, for instance, and pneumococcal vaccine. But, you know, so he had approached me and he had said, Oren Levine, Dr. Oren Levine, who um, was the newly appointed director of their vaccine delivery group at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Oren uh, had done EIS here at CDC and then subsequently went to Johns Hopkins. He led the uh, International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, group there. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is he he is the pneumococcal expert, uh, SME um, and uh, we work closely, our group, rotavirus group, and his group uh, on a joint grant from Gavi on facilitating the introduction of these vaccines, 
both Rhoda and Numo jointly. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, I'm sure Oren had fielded a bunch of names to approve uh, to reach out and contact, you know, um, to seek interest in uh, helping out with the end game. So where did you leave that first conversation? Yeah, I mean, frankly, I wasn't too interested. <laughs> I was very happy. I had a, a, quite a satisfying career uh, within CDC, within rotavirus. And I think, you know, at the time, they were just looking for good people. And they hadn't even thought about mechanisms or how do you get, you know, where would you go or how would you get these people to work on it? Do you leave them at CDC? Do you hire them? You know, the, my mind's thinking all sorts of things, you know, uh, as opposed to the topic itself initially. It, I think we had talked for maybe 30 minutes. But I was quite happy with the work I was doing, so, but also willing to talk to them because, you know, I think he had said uh, or in had uh, Asked, and it was quite an interesting topic, which I knew nothing about, by the way. <laughs> so, what did you say? Yeah, I, I spoke with him, and uh, I said I would uh, think about it, and I did. Uh, and I think you know what really got me motivated was I was I read a little bit, I read a couple of articles on the end game and what was at stake, and I, you know his pitch was really good. I mean, it's going to be an enormous challenge. And I think, you know, we, I recognize that right away. How do you introduce a new vaccine into a country in two or three years, into 120-something countries in two or three years? And here we were in rotavirus at the time, I think maybe 20, 30 countries had introduced. I'd spent six years since the vaccine came out. I was like, you know, that's nearly impossible. That's the first thing I think came to everyone's mind. But for me, it was like, wow, that sounds like an enor enormous opportunity. The second part of the challenge was I had always been on the disease side of things uh, at CDC for rotavirus, looking at you know how the vaccine works, how it does, why it doesn't work, what are the safety effects, and you know and sort of some of the policy issues related to disease. This was all operational. I mean, it wasn't really producing science. I was more involved with producing science. It was more consuming science and then translating it uh, for countries you know, and helping them make decisions, and then the operational side of things, the supply side, working with manufacturers. Uh, how do you get the vaccine uh, to the places you need in country, the delivery side of things? How do you uh, generate demand for these vaccines from decision makers to, you know, uh, mid-level managers to parents and caretakers yeah, to accept the vaccine? Financial side of things, how do you, you know, make sure that it's going to be uh, financially supported uh, were beneficial to the countries. All sorts of issues that I had no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say no clue, but I, I had consumed information about, but never been involved with the operational side of things. And so that was of, very appealing to me. And that kind of became your job. Yeah, and that kind of became my job. <laughs> so it was appealing, you know, and I'm always interested in learning new things. So it, that was appealing. So I didn't like automatically say no. I did say I would think about it. And uh, the first person that came to mind was Oren. I mean, uh, Walt Ornstein, uh, who was at Emory at the time. Uh, Dr. Ornstein, I think, I believe you've interviewed. Not yet, but Not well. yet. <laughs> He's, I mean, famous within uh, immunizations uh, in general. Uh, he led uh, the National Immunization Program at CDC for a number of years. And uh, certainly measles and polio are his passion, uh, polio eradication specifically. And uh, he had worked, he had led uh, the group at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that works on polio for a number of years, three years, I believe, and had recently moved back from the Gates Foundation to Emory. So, you know, just to triangulate, he worked at CDC, went to foundation, Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to Emory. Uh, and I had known um, uh, Dr. Ornstein through some previous uh, exchanges I've had with him. He's a wonderful guy, very approachable. So I sh shot off an email, at, you know, Walt, would you be willing to talk to me about this? And within a day, I think he'd set up a meeting, which is very unusual, I think, you know, for me, for somebody who's, you know, at such a high level and so busy and <laughs> to track down to meet the next day. So to me, it showed one, you know, uh, what a great guy he is, approachable. I didn't know it that well. Uh, and two, his interest in the topics. So I talked to him, and I think we talked maybe for an hour. Did you and go to his office? I went to his office just around the corner at Emory. 
uh, met with him and his assistant, Diane Miller, another uh, who makes Walt work. <laughs> uh, and uh, the two of them, you know, the conversation we had was, I think, uh, made a compelling argument for me to consider this further. What, what played into that? What, what played into say? it? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, f first of all, I think any time, and I didn't know this, uh, talk to Walt, first 45 minutes you talk about the science, and which was just, I mean, I, it, you know, we didn't talk about any, I mean, in my mind there were all sorts of questions, uh, and a lot of them, you know, some were science and some were, you know, how important is this? How valuable is this compared to what I'm doing now? You know, I wanted career advice. You know, do I leave, you know, a great hand on the table <laughs> for something I, you know, I know nothing about uh, and those sort of things. But for him, it was all science and polio eradication. So there was this passion that I just sensed right away with Walt, uh, which was just amazing. And, uh, you know, he was so committed to the process of polio eradication and how close we were at the time to eradicating polio. And really the next big step was introducing IPV. He really, really strongly, passionately, and not just, you know, I don't think it was fervor that was uh, without evidence. I mean, it was all evidence-based passion, I would say. <laughs> He knew IPV is what was going to push polio over the edge. This is my interpretation, by the way, uh, of it. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I, so for him, IPV introduction in the span of two, three years was going to be immensely challenging, immensely challenging. But it is what was necessary for polio eradication. So you know, just hearing that was tremendously useful to me. Number one. Number two, he was having parallel discussions with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at the same time to set up some uh, to set up a group at the Task Force for Global Health, and no detailed uh, plans, but to have the IMG, or at the time there was no IMG, but a group like the IMG, the implementers of the end game at the Task Force for Global Health with you know, leadership from all over, but Task Force for Global Health would be the secretariat and would be the convener and the implementers of the end game in collaboration with all the partners. And that's what his vision was. And he hadn't known about, you know, uh, Apurva or the foundation contacting me and so on. And, you know, for him, I think it was, it, it just, timing was perfect. He said, Manish, this is just an immensely wonderful opportunity. Let me put you in touch with the Task Force Global Health. Let's meet. Let's see how we can make this work. And so, the, uh, you know, I think things just started moving on. And that was the end of 2012. Uh, yeah, it was right around the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. So that is just before eradication in India was certified, is That's, that correct? It was, uh, yeah, certification, yes, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think they had gone a couple of years, a uh, year and a half or so, maybe a couple of years of no case, cases. So in the conversation with Walt Orenstein, mm -hmm. Dr. Orenstein, um, did you, what did you know about polio at that time? Was that one of your first in-depth conversations about it? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what I knew about polio was, you ever play the game Whack-A-Mole? Yes. <laughs> you pop it here and it pops up elsewhere and you pop it here and it pops up elsewhere and, you know, it's this never-ending game. <laughs> uh, I mean, so I think within, I hadn't thought deeply about polio. I certainly was committed to the concept of eradication because it's one of the eradicatable diseases and I you know, I'm bought into the idea that if we can eradicate it, we should um, for all the re reasons that have been listed. So, you yeah, know, I totally support, have supported polio eradication. I was uh, if, if familiar with polio and that rotavirus and polio have had very similar stories. Uh, so both are enteric gut infections. The route of transmission is fecal oral. Um, they tend to be uh, endemic or cause high burden of disease year round in developing countries, tend to be epidemic 
in de uh, developed countries. Epidemiology is very similar. Obviously, polio is a neurologic, ultimately a neurologic disease, and rota tends to be a GI, symptomatically a GI There's element. There's no paralysis. But in, exactly, but the yeah. mechanism of the infection is very similar. Uh, so that's one. Two is the vaccines. I mean, that was my interest. Uh, I, I had spent a fair amount of time researching polio vaccines, OPV, for rotavirus vaccines. Um, what can we learn from that program for our program? So both are oral vaccines. Well, obviously polio has IPV as well. And rota, uh, in the rudimentary stages of developing uh, injectable vaccine as well learning from polio again, but both have uh, as a base oral vaccines. And uh, both vaccines work poorly in developing countries and work really well in uh, Europe and US and industrialized nations. Nobody really understands why, but um, there was this uh, gentleman, Dr. Jacob John in India, he's considered you know, the father of infectious diseases in India or vaccines in general. Uh, tremendously uh, uh, brilliant man who has worked on polio all his life. And in the early, uh, late 60s and early 70s, in this small uh, area of India, uh, uh, Valor, South India, uh, Christian Medical College, CMC, he had his research base. And he, you know, asked the question, why does OPV not work, oral polio vaccines? And he introduced IPV in these communities there and found that IPV works wonderfully in stopping elimination. This is in the, I think, late 60s, early 70s, and had written some papers on it, you know, that OPV doesn't work because of the force of infection. The kids, the guts basically reject the vaccine when you give them to the orally, because, you know, a uh, way you can look at it is, you know, uh, their guts are like made of steel so much exposure to so many different bugs and pathogens and you know the ones who live and survive are the strongest you know survival of the fittest and so their guts reject any live oral vaccines which is essentially an infection that you're introducing um you know synthetic infection into the gut they just spit it right back out i mean that's my simple way of understanding it but he studied that when nobody else was looking at it and so he's been a huge proponent of parenteral bypassing the gut to give injection to get immunity, huge. And there's been obviously, you know, uh, two big camps ever since. Um, so long story short is, you know, I contacted Dr. Jo Jacob John uh, through, you know, uh, and tried to see, you know, maybe is, uh, is are the reasons that uh, those vaccine OPV is not working. Same reasons that rota vaccines are not working. Rota vaccines, you know, and again, Dr. Glass, Dr. Parshar, they've been looking into this for a number of years before I'd gotten there. Why these vaccines don't work in the poorest countries? That's where the kids are dying, right? And uh, and as it turns out, there's no good data on that for rota vaccines. Very tough to study, but we so we had written papers to try to extrapolate that information from polio to rota. And then the third aspect, uh, uh, one is, you know, obviously the disease side, the vaccines were quite similar, rota and polio. And the third is the safety. Uh, polio has, caught, has adverse event known as VAP, a vaccine associated paralytic polio, and then CVDPVs, vaccine derived poliovirus, uh, because the vaccine itself mutates. Rota vaccine does, but doesn't cause problems. It mutates as well, but doesn't cause any serious problems so far. However, it is associated with this rare form of adverse event known as intussusception, which is a blockage in the bowel. Uh, and it's a famous story within vaccines in general. US had introduced an oral vaccine in 1990s, late 1990s the first country to do so. And then within a matter of six months, a number of children uh, nationwide had developed into susception. Handful, you know, um, less than 100. And that prompted a nationwide investigation uh, to look for the cause of the into susception, which was identified to be that rotavirus vaccine. And within a year, the vaccine was pulled from the market. Uh, CDC, it was one of those defining moments within CDC history you know, such as Ebola and, you know, of course, smallpox and, you know, monkeypox and, you know, 9-11, uh, you know, where everything stops and all epidemiologists sort of focus on, you know, all decks on hand sort of 
it, that's the study that was done out of CDC to look at the association between vaccine and intussusception. Uh, so at that time, you know, within vaccines, everyone knows about that. And Alan Hinman talked about it. He did talk about it. Thank you. So I can stop. Uh, so that has defined. Not in depth, though. So this is great. The <laughs> reason really. I mentioned that, and by the way, Dr. Orenstein was the director of NIP at the time when he ultimately had to make the decision with support from ACIP to withdraw the vaccine from the U.S. market. Uh, huge uh, uh, consequences, not just for the U.S., but global uh, programs as well. Nobody had introduced it, but there were high hopes. Half a million kids were dying from rotavirus disease worldwide. Intussusception, while serious adverse event, was is very rare. You're talking about, you know, maybe if there was a serious link, you would have a few hundred extra deaths of intussusception worldwide compared to half a million from rotavirus. So it's this sort of, you know, risk of omission versus commission. Uh, withholding vaccine causes adverse events as well, uh, if you look at it that way. So that discussion never happened worldwide because it wasn't good enough for the U.S. You know, country after country stood up at a WHO meeting and said, it's not good enough for us. And so it killed that vaccine. And surprisingly, um, manufacturers still pursued interests uh, in developing two new vaccines. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the safety side was very relevant uh, for both programs. Obviously, uh, the end game is hinges around the safety of oral polio vaccines. Since you bring up risk, um, there was a lot of international discussion about risk in the end game strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so to bridge us from rotavirus mm -hmm. into the end game, um, you had your conversation with Walt Orenstein, mm -hmm. at some point you made the decision to make the move. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could pick up there. How did you decide? Yeah, so you know, and Walt. Uh, so I was very. I think he had sparked my interest even further to talk with the Task Force for Global Health, and he had arranged a meeting very soon, within a few days. And and in retrospect, I know why. Uh, the the director of the, the program at Task Force, Mark McKinley. Uh, he's, I mean, he moves fast and, uh, you know, it's a, a grants based agency and, and, and they like to do good work. It, they want grants. They, this was a great opportunity, perfect for them to, you know, uh, leave an impact, uh, within polio itself uh, to have a program such as the end game based out of the task force for global health. And they were looking for a director within their minds. They had some, you know, rudimentary vision of what this would look like at the task force, uh, how it would work out. And with, at that point, they were just looking for, you know, uh, uh, some commitment from somebody who would lead that program. And I think, you know, they just saw an opportunity that here was somebody, you know, that Gates Foundation had approached separately about. And so these parallel discussions, so they met and, you know, I met him. And at the same time, uh, so he brought along Alan Hinman who Alan, as you interviewed, you know, he was a senior strategic advisor. I don't know the technical name, but, you know, guru basically who had been there for a number of years. And uh, I had met Alan a couple of times, but did not know him, uh, you know, on a personal level, knew of him. And so, you know, Walt and Alan and Mark, I think, you know, you know, I was just, yeah, I was just charmed by the three of them. And my first meeting, again, this was, I had had, 30 minute call talk with Approva and then Walt Orenstein. And then I met him, I think, matter of days. Uh, we were in Decatur. I drove out, and he already had drafted like a two page outline of what he had envisioned. And my name as a director. <laughs> so I think those are the sort of things I, I was still, I, I tend to be a little more cautious about those sort of things. So, I mean, I, it was six months, I think, between that meeting and me ultimately going over there. Uh, I hadn't decided. Uh, so I listened in on a lot of calls. We had weekly calls after that, the four of us, as well as another person, Sam Klugline, who was a deputy to Mark. And we had, uh, over the course of three months, I think, put together an application for the Gates Foundation on what would Polio Endgame uh, look like from the task force. 
essentially what the IMG had ultimately, you know, uh, taken on, creating a board of advisors, hiring people within the task force, hiring people who would be in country at WHO, at UNICEF, country support, and the total grant amount of, you know, uh, many millions of dollars and put that together over three months through weekly calls and meetings and person meetings, strategy sessions. I think it had been three months, but at least eight to 12 weeks or so. And, you know, I sat in, I think they had made the assumption that I was going to do it. I don't think I'd ever said yes, because I, you know, there were still a lot of logistical issues to be worked out, obviously, because I was 10 years into my CDC career, 12 years. Uh, I'm a commissioned core officer. And so, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of other issues related to like logistics. Do I quit? Give up a, you know, great career to go to the task force, you know, which is what I think what they wanted. There were, it talks about maybe secondment to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or, you know, all sorts of different ways of doing it. But we hadn't talked about that at all because that would happen once the grant. So anyway, all this just gave me a lot of uh, time to mull over it. Um, so I, and then I think three months later, they had received affirmation that they would get the grant. However, at the same time, uh, unbeknownst to us, the IMG was set up by the partners. So the partners themselves, WHO, UNICEF, CDC, Rotary, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had set up the IMG to lead the end game. Uh, it, and that's when I had my hesitation. I wasn't too convinced that, you know, these groups, because I'm already at CDC, I sort of had some sort of at least internal understanding of how, you know, the IMG would operate and what would be the role of task force at this point. Um, and so there were a lot, and I actually said no and backed out. Uh, but then I think they had more specific defin defined role for task force from the Gates Foundation to support uh, IMG so in what, implementing the end game. How did that shift? What became the role of the task force? It, so it still remained ill-defined. And, you know, that, that's that been one of the, <laughs> I, I think, uh, one of the huge risks, I think, in how this thing was set up. Uh, at the time, it was, uh, I think from the foundation's perspective, my sense is uh, it was almost an insurance policy. You know, here uh, for the IMG itself, you could say uh, you have WHO, CDC, and our organizations tend to be, you know, slow for good reasons, you know, methodical and um, not necessarily able to contracts, for instance, of hiring new people and implementing it tends to take time. And here they had specific two to three year uh, time frame within which to introduce IPV, as I mentioned, in all these countries and then switch. Uh, so, you know, the, I think Bill and the Gates Foundation always had questioned, you know, whether, and I think the organizations themselves probably had questioned, you know, <laughs> whether they were uh, able to pull that off. And so I think the task force tends to be nimble, tends to be quick. It's easier to set up uh, logistically, you know, the contracts and mechanisms. It had, of course, you know, Walt Ornstein, Alan Hinman, uh, you know, Dr. Fagy's uh, mentorship, uh, uh, Dr. McKinley, who's involved with polio um, uh, for a number of years, several decades rather. Uh, so, you know, it had, uh, but they weren't sure that Task Force had the bandwidth from Decatur <laughs> to pull all this off. So, you know, I think that's what they were struggling with. <clears throat> so there was no defined role, but they'll have us there as support of any and all form. Could you briefly summarize the <clears throat> different forms of expertise that were pulled in mm -hmm. in those planning kinds of calls? Like when they were envisioning what that would look like, what were they pulling in? Yeah, the IMG. Or uh, the task force. The task force, but then yeah. So we had put together a proposal, which was very nice and sound, and uh, you know, uh, it, it had uh, essentially what the IMG had uh, recommended. You know, what does it take? The fundamental question is, what is it going to take uh, for these countries to introduce IPV? Uh, and we all had brought our different uh, experiences to the table. Um, and there were five or six different work streams I think that would be needed 
One is uh, supply side of issues, you know, working with pharmaceuticals to make sure that there is going to be adequate and sustained supply of at least one dose of IPV. So working with pharmaceuticals to facilitate that. And uh, alongside that, regulatory issues. All these countries, you know, we learned from H1N1 at the time, the pandemic, there was all this flu vaccine available worldwide, but couldn't be introduced into countries because of licensure issues, you know. You couldn't import it into a country, right? Because um, they have regulatory steps you have to go through, and that takes time. Applications and <laughs> and so you know all those issues had to be so working on that. Um, there were challenges related to financial side. Who would fund it and how would you fund it? And what were the mechanisms at the time? Gavi was not involved. Gavi, as I mentioned earlier, uh, introduces new vaccines but didn't have funding envisioned for IPV into their portfolio, and so they hadn't been involved. Uh, but, you know, so how would we get the financial support to countries? What would they be the mechanisms? So thinking through those issues and setting up, you know, uh, work streams for that. Um, there were issues related to technical support to countries uh, in the form of, uh, you know, operational capacity and how to actually uh, scale up the capacity to introduce these vaccines on a rapid basis. Uh, they have advisory groups in countries, NITAGs, decision-making meetings, how to support that, uh, you know, give them the necessary scientific base to introduce the vaccine, and then uh, training issues related uh, to a new vaccine. There were some specific issues with IPV. It was only one dose, or at least one dose is a technical term. Most vaccines tend to be three doses, given at specific ages. IPV one dose at the time was recommended at 14 weeks. Uh, so, you know, with the third dose of vaccine, six, 10, 14 weeks. How do you actually, you know, get them just to give that one dose at the third dose? Seems simple enough, but requires training and issues. And, you know, so that was a third work stream. And then issues related to cold chain capacity in countries. Uh, uh, this was a vaccine that had to be kept at a certain temperature and requires space. Most of these countries have a, uh, many of these countries have cold chain that is not necessarily able to absorb new vaccines, refrigerators, freezers, you know, across the country. So building that capacity up, uh, assessing the capacity uh, and building it up. And then advocacy and communications was a huge component <laughs> of, as we all know, of any of these uh, initiatives. I uh, saw workshops and dry Dry runs. Dry runs, yeah. yeah. And bringing in contractors. Correct, correct. Yeah, and so this was, you know, again, the early sort of envision, how would we pull this off? You know, we, this was five of us in a room uh, before a policy uh, was set in place or any official group was set in place. So, so this was just in silo. And then at the same time, as I mentioned, IMG was uh, in parallel formed within a matter of weeks. Huh? This is uh, between, I think, March and April uh, of 2013, if I remember correctly. How did you uh, find out about the IMG? Uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I think, you know, they uh, told us on a call that, hey, listen, you know, uh, and we were, of course, having bilateral exchanges uh, with them while developing the protocol. I mean, the foundation was quite honest with us, you know, and we're supportive that, yeah, this sounds good. And, uh, and at the same time, they said, you know, sounds like the partners have decided uh, to set something up. And we would want we want you to be at the meeting. I was at CDC. I could not go. I had I mean, my role was completely ill-defined in this uh, at the time. So I think Alan Hinman went to the first meeting. I I think they had maybe 10, 12 people there. You know, one or two people from each one of the agencies. Uh, um, maybe more, probably more. And Alan Hinman had been the task force representative to that, uh, and they had developed something very similar to what we had and visaged and su submitted to Gates Foundation, uh, which I think you had mentioned the different work groups of the IMG, routine immunization strengthening, financial, uh, d uh, delivery, country implementation, supply and demand, advocacy and communications, and then regulatory. Those were the six initial work groups of the IMG. So from this point in time, how did, how did the timeline develop? For uh, the 
For actual um, implementation of for actual implementation, yes, up through the switch. Up through the switch, yeah. So uh, glad you bring up the switch. Switch was the ultimate goal. I mean, of the introduction of IPV and routine immunization strengthening was to withdraw the type two component of oral polio vaccine, uh, the switch. But that was only one of the work streams. Is that the switch itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the time, switch was not on anyone's mind. Okay. I mean, I everyone knew that at the time. <laughs> Funny thing is, I think the only envisaged aspect of the switch was we would pull the trivalent oral polio vaccine, which has type two, and introduce BOPV bivalent oral polio vaccine on one day in April 2016. Correct. And that was in the end game plan. One day in all these countries, they didn't know the number of countries, but you know, hundred some countries. That's our ultimate goal. But I think nobody talked about you know what that means, what does that entail. There's never been a switch like that ever. So you know the mechanics, the mechanics, and the actual nitty gritty of that. What we hadn't talked about it, I think for good reason. I mean, I think prior to getting there, we had to introduce IPV, meaning all the children had to be immunized against the type 2 virus by another mechanism. We're not going to stop immunizing against type 2. We're going to stop immunizing from type 2 from the oral polio vaccine, but kids still need to be immunized. They'll get their immunity through another route, the shot. First. First. We have to do that because if we don't do that and we pull it, then you know it uh, defeats a purpose because type 2 can come back if they're unimmunized, right? So polio eradication takes a huge step back. So for that switch to happen on April 2016, which was a date I think at that time was not completely arbitrary, but uh, you know. Um, That's uh, a low season. It's low season, it, it, you know, it was three or four years from now and it was anticipated that by then we would get all this stuff done. And so, you know, it was aspirational of course, I should say. Um, but the biggest thing on people's mind was introducing IPV. Uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, what was talked about. So that was our goal, was the IPV introduction. So Switch, we hadn't even come close to thinking about. There was no work plan. There was no detailed uh, thought to it. And so we were all thinking IPV introduction. So that's what I think I was uh, uh, describing to you, you know, with those six work groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and nothing, you know, of course, no details had been thought through about IPV introduction either because... I think at that point they were just getting the groups together. How did this develop? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I think again, in hindsight, you know, and there's books written on this. How do you deliver on an initiative of global scale with five big partners? You know, what's the best way to do it? You know, do you just shoot from the hips and go forward, or what are the lessons learned from other places and those sort of things? Um, and uh, you know, they had. I think obviously this initiative worked for various reasons, but one of the reasons was there was buy-in from the highest level, it's polio eradication. WHO is big chunk of their, uh, you know, their purse is polio eradication, so it's of high interest. Countries, same thing, you know, they're very interested in getting rid of polio so they can move on. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so they- I, Sorry, excuse me. No, no, absolutely. So I think they had uh, commitment from the highest level uh, so I think the people who were initially sent to the IMG and representing their I institutions were top leaders. Uh, how did they develop the work plan? I, it really started, I think, in June of 2016. So the first meeting was pretty much, uh, you know, the top folks deciding, yep, we're in agreement, we're going to form the IMG. And you were not at that meeting. I was at the meeting. Me. Alan represented us from the task force for global health. Um, and at the time, I think, you know, talking to Alan, I don't know if Alan spoke about that specific meeting itself. I, it was a big surprise, you know, that, you know, what is the task force doing there sort of thing? Uh, because I think, you know, obviously they weren't even thinking about mechanics of implementing. They were just thinking about setting up the IMG. Do you remember what Alan Hinman said when he came back? I, I I don't, but I you know Alan is a very blunt man, and the sense I remember is he wasn't optimistic, 
that the task force would be a welcome member of that group because I believe he had to introduce himself at the meeting and what he was doing there, that he wasn't introduced, uh, you know, by Bill Mulney. Because I think it was all nebulous and, you know, I don't think people knew. And, and certainly nobody talked about the grant that task force is submitted to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I think he had to introduce himself. And that sort of, you know, sent me a message. Well, and that's what I was describing earlier at that point. I was like, you know, well, I've got a good thing going. I mean, this is wonderful and I'm sure they'll sort it out. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so funny. So what would you say was the next phase mm -hmm. of development? Was it laying out kind of the logistics and the work streams for IPV? That's that's absolutely it. You hit the uh, nail on the head. In June, I think, was the meeting, and I attended that one, the first official meeting of the IMG, the, Where? now the group in Geneva. Um, in a small room, you know, maybe 30 people uh, were there. And again, I think, you know, they were all the highest representatives from each one of the respective agencies that would, Michelle Zafran, uh, I don't think they'd assigned co-chairs by then, or they were they had just finalized the co-chairs, which would be Michelle Zafran from uh, WHO and Joss Vandelier from uh, UNICEF. And both of them were respective heads of their immunization units, EPI program at WHO and at the UNICEF, uh, which I think you know shows the commitment of each one of those agencies. Um, and CDC uh, had sent, uh, you know, uh, our highest representative for routine immunization and new vaccine introduction, uh, Vance Dietz, to the meeting. Gavi was there. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rotary. Again, Rotary had sent the highest folks. Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, you know, I think, not to say that they're not high, but they were project officers, but not necessarily, you know, I mean, they're a small organization and donors, but they had sent the appropriate, the high folks there. How so many? they... That's where I think, you know, day one was sort of just people venting and how are we going to do this? What is this? Kind of, you know, uh, which we can get to. But uh, day two and three, I think, were let's lay out the detailed work plan. Uh, of, how many people uh, did you know in the room? I, no, I, I mean, global health in immunization is pretty small. Okay. So a fair number, actually. Yeah, fair number. I mean, the Gates Foundation people I knew from before, from working with them. A wonderful person, Taslim Kachra, who's, you know, who would, her role was a rotavirus before. So I'd worked with her uh, uh, from WHO, uh, the immunization folks I'd worked with on rotavirus. Uh, UNICEF I had not had much experience with before. And I knew all the CDC folks. Mm -hmm. So everybody was in one room. Everyone was in one room. Mm hmm so you laid out the plan. Also, I want to check in. Do you, yeah. would you like a break? We can take a break. No, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. I'm okay. <laughs> laid out a plan. Um, yeah, so, you know, if, in retrospect, really, I think, you know, it was Michel Zafran and his counterpart uh, is, uh, at the time, I don't think it was decided, but she's a secretariat, uh, Simona Zipersky. The two of them, I, you know, I led the meeting. And then uh, it was also attended by the polio eradication folks. So just to take a step back, I think polio eradication folks had decided that this work stream, the end game, and the introduction of IPV and the switch, uh, we should involve the routine immunization people. And I think you probably have talked about the, you know, the vertical versus the horizontal. A bit. But a bit. it's interesting to have everyone's take on it, if you yeah. want to comment. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, the description basically is, you know, uh, polio has always been in a silo and for good reasons. But at the same time, it's obviously benefited and not necessarily a, as a planned approach to benefiting other things, but it has built a base of immunization platform from which we've you know, done measles work and introduced all these new vaccines and continues to support immunization workers worldwide. Ebola. Ebola. I mean, all sorts of things. So, you know, it hasn't been, of course, you know, nobody's laid out a work plan of how to do that. And that's been the big criticism. You know, of course, there's side benefits the fallout, the good fallout from polio eradication. So that's been the big criticism, you know, from the hardcore horizontal people who want to build a system from which we can immunize all kids against all possible diseases. 
uh, as opposed to working in our little silos. Because, you know, the, uh, fundamentally it's the same, right? You need a worker, you need, you know, a fridge, you need, you know, to keep the vaccine cold, you need trained people to give the vaccine, and then it doesn't matter what the antigen is. Uh, so the polio folks are very much committed to polio eradication. At the time, polio was not eradicated, still not eradicated. So their goal is, you know, surveillance, find where the disease is, get the vaccine out there, uh, you know, outbreak control, uh, you know, those sort of things, and continue to raise funds, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's this end game, it doesn't really fit into, you know, in their personalities, their <laughs> their work plan, their, you know, I mean, yeah, somebody, it has to be done, but we need to eradicate first before we get to the end game. So they're still eradicating. And I think, you know, my perspective is they handed the ball off to the, you know, folks. Here you go, you know, we need your support and help and your expertise, you know, to introduce a new vaccine in all these countries and all the stuff that has to come along with it. And so all the people who were in the room had some polio experience, because everybody has some polio experience at one time or another in immunization, it seems, but not really, were not polio eradicators. The IMG, I would say none of them probably were, you know, they were immunization, routine immunization people, immunization strengthening people, new vaccine introduction people. Um, and they, while they knew about polio and, you know, none of us understood why just one dose of IPV, you know, why just two or three years, how much, how many children do you have to have vaccinated as a benchmark before you get to withdraw OPV in these two, three years coverage, right? Because we always, when we want to get a new vaccine in, we are aiming for a coverage. We don't just want to introduce a vaccine. We want to introduce it and reach a certain number of children, 80%, 90%, 100%. <laughs> so those, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So th those questions were not thought about or answered or, you know, so the first day there were lots of questions, more than answers, you know. Um, who were Bruce, some of the voices in the room? Who so was... uh, for the routine immunization side, I mentioned, you know, all the IMG people, the folks, uh, you know, experienced people in delivery of vaccines of all kinds. Okay, we're going to pick up from the break with a uh, discussion about who was in the first IMG <laughs> meeting that Manish attended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I mentioned, uh, you know, the routine immunization folks and the IMG uh, members or the new members members of the newly formed IMG. Uh, myself, I represented Task Force, Mark McKinley, the two of us were there. And then also in the room were the polio eradicators, I guess, you know, the, the highest leadership of GPEI. And that was Bruce Aylward and Hamid Joffrey and um, Roland Sutter, you know, from the science side of things. So these were, you know, the top leaders at the WHO on polio. It's almost, in thinking out loud, it's like an arranged marriage. <laughs> you know, the two families coming together for the first time, sitting down. Because I think all the people on the IMG, my understanding was, and myself included, yeah, we knew, we kind of understood what was required at a very high level, but didn't really have a sense of, you know, nobody thought through all the details, kind of like what you wanted, the work plan and those sort of things, but had many questions. And then, uh, of course, you know, it was quite clear and Bruce and Hamid and Roland and the polio side of why IPV, you know, the science behind it, the nuances, they're very uh, technical details that are tough to just absorb by new folks coming in, even trained folks in infectious disease. But they were, it was quite clear, but there was a, not necessarily a clear communication between the two groups, not just WHO, but even within CDC, probably you could say, you know, they're a siloed, polio is a silo and Immunization systems is a separate silo. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there was, I, I, tension's probably not a right word, but I guess, like I said, you know, <laughs> meeting of the families <laughs> for an arranged marriage uh, and, you know, the bride and the groom sitting there trying to figure out, you know, what their role is. And I think on the routine immunization side, these weren't volunteers who would just raise their hand and said, you know, yeah, I, Let's start up the IMG and introduce IPV worldwide. I think these are people who had other day jobs 
and other personal goals and career goals for immunization system strengthening and their own groups to deal with at their respective agencies. And they were asked, told, you know, that they would take this on, this new initiative. Uh, so in this, in this environment of not tension, but maybe tension, Yeah. who, who were the formal and informal leaders yeah. in the room? So the formal leaders, you know, uh, Bruce Elward uh, uh, opened the meeting with us. Hamid Joffrey was there. Those are, you know, I think the key, uh, uh, and Roland Sutter from the polio eradication side. The IMG was majority of the group. That was a meeting for the IMG first meeting. And Michelle Zafran that I mentioned, you know, WHO, uh, Joss uh, from UNICEF, Vance Dietz, uh, uh, John Seaver from Rotary, um, Bill Mon Gates Foundation, Tazleen Kachra, and then Gavi. Um, I think it was Alan, I forget his last name, uh, but from Gavi, um, the representation. And who am I leaving out? I think that's all of them. So at any rate, uh, those are the routine immunization folks. And there are a lot of questions, good questions, you know. Uh, and I think some of them I mentioned, uh, this IPV introduction, you know, I mean, first of all, there was just, I think, this general sense that this is just uh, an aspirational goal. Two to three years getting a new vaccine in. I mean, are you kidding yourself? <laughs> Realistic uh, you know, world reality kind of thing, right? I mean, that, that's it, fast. Th yeah, that's fast. And that was sort of, I think, what we were working from. Was there optimism? I'm sure there are optimistic people, but even then, it takes a fair amount of, you know, uh, 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 reality checking to make sure that that's feasible. So that was sort of the routine immunization type of mindset. I think polio side was, you know, more strategy. We need to get it out there. And of course, it's, the IMG's task to do it. Uh, so there are a lot of questions, I think, from this group. And, it's, you know, like one specific question was coverage. You know, how much coverage? You know, when we're talking about introduction, we're not just talking about introduction, but how many kids do you vaccinate? And as a I, benchmark? As a benchmark to go to the next level of switch. You know, we're introducing to switch, to withdraw the vaccine. How many kids do you, how do you measure it? Is it in all countries? It's just, you know, each country has heterogeneous coverage and you know, all sorts of issues related coverage that takes years and decades. I mean, they've been, you know, as I mentioned, the six traditional vaccines are still overall global coverage as it was at the time, 80 something percent. With countries like Chad, it's 40%, Nigeria was 49%, you know. What's your benchmark? Are you wanting to get to 80% uh, IPV coverage? in whatever age. Which was the goal of EPI? Is that 80%? 80%, uh, depending on the country, 90%. Uh, yeah. 90%, I think, is uh, you know one of the big goals. Uh, at the time, I'm not sure. This GVAP, I think, is Global Vaccine Action Plan. I believe it's 90% at the time is what the but aspiration was. At this point, it was just a question, or did anybody jump in and start to answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. big question, right? I mean, huge question. I mean, uh, you know, and, and so the, that was one specific example. And so Bruce answered it. And then Bruce, uh, uh, who you'll interview, is was the leader of GPI at the time. Since then, he stepped down and moved to, I mean, remarkable person. I mean, his reputation precedes himself, you know, and uh, uh, very intelligent, uh, very articulate, um, is thinking 10 steps ahead of the person in front of him, usually typically from my, my observations. I knew of him, didn't know him. Uh, and uh, I mean, very much impressed me by, uh, you know, the sound answers to many of the questions. So this specific question I remember, uh, you know, he, he said really his benchmark was to get the vaccine into the country. 1%, 10%, doesn't matter. Higher, the better, obviously. Uh, and the reason I think he had mentioned one, one of the reasons was H1N1. You know, he said, uh, the, you know, we don't want uh, the H1N1 situation where we have all these vaccines, but cannot get into the country because there's no licensure, there's no preparation, there's no decision making that's been done on this vaccine. All sorts of things that I have to have. Here, I want this vaccine ready in all these countries and at least some kids have received it. So, so I think that gave me a sense that they were thinking that 
IPV is not necessarily for finishing the job of eradication, which is I think what partly one of the understanding for us was, is when we introduce a vaccine, we're introducing it to get rid of a disease. We're not using a vaccine as an insurance policy. In their mind, it was sort of, you know, like we're gonna, if there's an outbreak of type two virus, we'll already have this vaccine in the system and we can rev it up really fast and stop outbreak. So it's outbreak control, right? Which is what they do, you know, Built put fires in. out. Exactly. So that's, I think, you know, that, and that wasn't communicated at all. And that's tough to communicate, obviously. Uh, tough nuance, uh, you know. Because if he's saying 1%, 2%, that doesn't sound like it's enough to really make a, an impact. Not for eradication. For That's exactly right. And we're, again, you know, we're babies in this field at that time and understanding it. So, and that also tells me, you know, how, how do we communicate that to countries also, right? Because what we're thinking is going to be, is going to reflect questions countries are going to have. But at any rate, that was, you could see some of the, you know, uh, misunderstanding of what the objective was amongst some of the highest level people at the time. That's natural. This was the first meeting, first day of how things transpire. Uh, but I think, you know, Bruce had a pretty good answer, not necessarily satisfying answer for everyone, but at least, you know, we got to understand uh, what, it is and how we start thinking about how do we communicate that or how we incorporate that into this initiative. That's one good example. You know, of course, there were issues related to the finance, the Gavi's role, different partners, you know, those sort of, a lot of other things. But I think one of, one of the issues, key issues was understanding why we are doing this so fast. Uh, and is it really necessary? You know, uh, you know, getting buy-in, I guess. <laughs> Although the t mandate was already done. I mean, it was made by the World Health Assembly and, you know, we're almost, it was almost there. But SAGE had approved it and, you know, so the agencies at the highest level and decision makers and advisory groups had technically agreed to this plan, donors. Uh, so it wasn't ours to question it at this point, but certainly as implementers, you have to get buy-in so you can do your job well, right? Uh, Two questions. I was wondering if you could speak about Gavi a little bit, um, and also after that, talk about one the tr the goal of one day of doing the switch in one yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another. I, I don't think we talked too much about it, but I think we just laughed it off at that point. You know, one day is what had written uh, had been written down. But once again, I think switch was not something anybody was thinking about. Everybody was really thinking and talking about IPV and what it's going to take to get it, that part done. Uh, question about, and we maybe we can come back to the switch because it's sure, you know, yes. it's probably a that one day discussion is important and had consequences and how we address that later on. But the Gavi question, uh, yeah, Gavi was new to the table as well, just like the other partners, the other not partners necessarily, but the specific people from the immunization side. Um, <clears throat> and Gavi, I think, you know, again, from the highest level, they decided that Gavi would be, because Gavi has been so involved with new vaccine introductions, uh, and they have this mechanism set up with all these countries where we want to introduce IPV. Not all of them, but at the time, I think 73 of the 120 something. So the covering at least like 80, 90% of the birth cohort that we were interested in, the bigger countries. They had established relationships, mechanisms of how to get donor funding to the countries, the accountability mechanisms, the application process, and so on and so forth. So, but they didn't have, uh, you know, the allocation for IPV funding allocation. Donors hadn't agreed to that, and, you know, obviously have a for budget. For the vaccine. For, for the vaccine, for any of that, rolling it out, the support to the countries. So GPEI would provide them the money, is my understanding, rudimentary understanding, and uh, Gavi would uh, use their mechanism. And they, you know, of course, went through their mechanisms simultaneously. I think they hadn't agreed to it, the board of directors for Gavi, but subsequently, soon after, I think the IMG, the board approved this process. But in that meeting, Gavi was wondering also what their role would be. Ye correct. I mean, it, w it was not finalized. I think the higher level discussions between, you know, for example, uh, Seth Berkeley and Bruce had happened. Uh, but, you know, Gavi, of course, has its own I mean, CEO. Of the, Gavi, I don't think, can make a commitment uh, without the board approving it. So I think, you know, in principle, they had, at the time, were presenting 
different options for the board to consider. And certainly, I think at the time, uh, it, well, yeah, so it, it, they hadn't agreed to it. But it, it seemed, uh, I mean, at least the informal uh, handshake had happened between the <laughs> agencies, is my understanding. And everybody was in the room. Yeah, and Gabby was present there, right? But yeah, of course, and uh, they had not uh, you know, made any form of commitments, and you know, as they, as I don't think they're able to, right? They were able to. So where, where do you remember that? What resolution do you remember that meeting coming to? Right. So you know, it is with all meetings. I think you know uh, there are good meetings and bad meetings, and I think you know if meetings are led well and you focus on you know the issues at hand and, and troubleshooting, and I think you know if you already have an objective in mind then you can go forward. And I think that's what happened. And that's what I learned in retrospect. Again, it was probably uh, Michelle Zafran uh, who led the meeting, uh, did, I think, a remarkable job of just keeping us on task. Yeah, there were lots of questions that were raised. Uh, but I think, you know, day one, we got familiar with each other. And then day two, I think we broke apart in groups and each one of the working groups uh, met and came up with a high-level work plan. Uh, and I think that was the idea. Miller and the Gates Foundation had some things in mind already that, hey, we really, I think the outcome they wanted from this was a high-level work plan. And who would be sort of the lead agencies at a very high level. Fill in, details to be filled in later by each one of the work groups. But ownership of, for example, the regulatory group, what are the high-level steps you need? And, uh, you know, and we had, uh, uh, they had a consultant there, Feruz Kurji, remarkable person, very intelligent, very bright, heavily involved throughout the end game from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and understands sort of, I think, you know, issues related to work plan development and how that facilitates. I mean, you can have high level strategy, but you have to execute it, right? And execution requires specifics, uh, tasks and uh, it, they had wanted that. And so I think, you know, they had like, for example, um, Microsoft Project is sort of the tool that they'd envisioned for keeping track of these 154 different work streams and, uh, you know, sub work streams within it and who would be specifically responsible within each agency and those sort of high level work plan was figured out, I think on day two uh, with details to be filled in by each work group. Number two, I think a decision on the work groups itself, who would chair each one of the work groups, uh, members of each one of the work groups. And that was formed, I think, uh, 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 or solidified at least at that meeting, which was a very important step. Uh, third, what would each one of the agencies bring to the IMG in terms of you know staff funding commitment? So they put slides together and they presented that. That was very important. And of course, you know, I think the day one, as I mentioned, was all the sort of the background and understanding and coming to sort of same level of understanding. So I, I think overall the meeting was a, the, a good benchmark for all of their IMG meetings. I mean, it was very successful. I think, you know, uh, uh, by the end of the meeting, all these folks who were there were sort of doers, you know? Yeah, they had questions, but they were they knew their task and they knew uh, they had to execute, and they were executors, and I think you could tell that. Um, and we had some specific outcomes also that came out. So it was a two-day meeting? Uh, you know, it was almost, the, I was there three days. So, I, I, yeah, it was a two-day meeting, and the third day was unofficial. I think we were meeting to wrap up some of the work. What happened in the wrap-up? No, I think it's details of what I just mentioned, okay. uh, solidifying. And so part of it, I think, also was uh, the t introduction of the task force. I remember on maybe, yeah, day two, we went to dinner, Mark McKinley, myself, with Michelle Zafran and Simona Zipersky and the task force. And, so, you know, um, as I mentioned, I don't think there was a clear delineated role for the task force. That We had a grant that we had specific stuff we'd laid out and a budget and all that wasn't formally introduced because I think, you know, it was, there were other issues to think about <laughs> at the time. But uh, the chair, uh, co-chair, 
Michelle and, and Simona, the Secretariat, I think was important for us to understand what support we would bring and how we would be available. And so we had set up a little uh, a plan for at least how we would function informally through our weekly calls and what kind of support we can bring and how we can make things happen. And we discussed at a very high level those sort of things. Okay. Uh, Think trust like, building, I guess you could say. <laughs> at the dinner. At the dinner. And day three, we sort of met with uh, more of the, some of the specific people within the WHO EPI program. Uh, we also met, oh, yeah, no, a subgroup. Several of the subgroups had met on day three. Um, what were those? So one of the biggest work streams initially was a supply-demand forecast, uh, which... I, I mean, again, now that everything was formed, we had to actually get to the specifics. So the specifics, the biggest specific before any of the other work has to happen is how many countries need IPV. Uh, that, you know, I don't think it had been mapped out. Information existed somewhere, right? Who's using it, who's not. Uh, so which countries were they? And then uh, how much IPV would they need? So that would be the demand side, you know, and that is based on a new vaccine. If you were to introduce it, what's their coverage? So, for example, if India has 80% coverage, you know, 80% times 4 million kids or whatever, you that's what their demand would be. Uh, multiplied times some wastage and some other things. So you do that for each one of the countries. Uh, I'm dumbing it down <laughs> because I think the person who does this for us spent a lot of time, a lot of factors go into the supply demand forecast. And then on the supply side of things, you know, uh, it essentially gives you a bunch of scenarios to for the companies and for the donors to figure out how much is this going to cost us? How long? Take? Does time factor into that? Time factors somewhat because you you sort of have an upswing in the introduction process and depending on their past experiences, how would you see it? So that's one of the things I go into it. But the ultimate, ultimate the big picture is for the companies, how much do I have to produce and by when? So yeah, it does go into it. Um, there were two companies, you know, that at the time uh, who had uh, committed or were able to provide the IPV. Who were they? Uh, Sanofi and B Bio. Uh, uh, Sanofi, I think, uh, had eighty percent of the market, or not market necessarily, but uh, uh, had uh, commitment to eighty percent of the supply, and B Bio the other twenty percent, somewhere around there. It was a Dutch company had recently been bought out by an Indian producer, but still, I think they would uh, the production and all aspects related to that would be within the Netherlands. Was there um, reasoning behind uh, selecting these producers to supply? You know, I, I'm not totally sure about. Uh, well, I mean, I think they could. Okay. First, I, I think that the facilities, or they were planning on building the facilities. A lot of that happened, uh, uh, I think, uh, by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and. Uh, I don't think Gabby was involved at that time, but they do a lot of that as well. You know, essentially meet with companies. WHO does that to a certain extent, but not as much. And UNICEF has a lot of relationships too, but that's more for eradication. Not, yeah. And, and so I guess by relationships, uh, yeah, obviously UNICEF is the supply. There's a supply division in Copenhagen that manages the supply. So they, uh, you know, to get it to the countries for countries that use UNICEF as the, um, uh, the bridge, I guess, between the manufacturer and the countries to, you know, issue the tender, which is, you know, this is how much we'll need and this is the kind of product we need. And then the companies bid on it and say, this is the price we'll give. And, you know, they come to an agreement on that for these pool of countries, more or less. That's what UNICEF does. But I think you're talking about yeah, way topic. before. No, 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 you're asking, I think, how do you decide these two companies? It's way so. I think there were a lot of you know behind the scenes. There was a lot of behind the scenes work with the people at the foundation because this is not your typical vaccine uh, where there's a clear market. Mm -hmm. You have to create a market. You have to have donors, and you have to have you know. I mean, there's a whole host of issues that are, that the companies need security before they can 
Am I making any sense? They need security before producing, producing that quantity, that so volume. Correct. That it's not just going to go to waste. That somebody's going to, you know, there's going to be a demand and there's going to be a, a, you know, a market for it. Whereas other vaccines that they are going to going to sell, I mean, they look for the market. They would initiate finding what market to, to generate that product for. But here, yeah, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think, I would say were the primary drivers of figuring out that. And Sanofi had uh, the capacity to build that, to get that. And there was a deal. And I think I had read at the time that, uh, you know, I mean, at the highest level, I think these were decisions, you know, Mr. Bill Gates had met with the producer, uh, owner of the company in India, Punawala uh, is his last name. Uh, and I think, you know, there was an agreement made that they would uh, <clears throat> produce the vaccine. So these are companies that have the capacity to do it. And, uh, and, and this was by day three. So day th by day three, it was known who would? Mm, I don't think at that time we had firm commitments that these were the two companies. But at the so now yeah, I'm jumping around a little bit. But yeah, to answer your question, that was a company side of things. But supply demand forecast is done by the IMG. Okay. Uh, for the, the group uh, to give to UNICEF and to manufacturers. So it's a r range of scenarios of introduction. You know, if they don't take it up, if countries, X percent it doesn't take it up, but if we all countries take it up like they're supposed to and those sort of things, this is how much we would need. <clears throat> the leader, uh, the person who led that work was uh, person Gavi, uh, who you know, does that work for all of their vaccines, quite familiar with it. And we kind of provided the technical input. So, uh, so that was the first huge piece of work that was needed for the IMG uh, to get the companies on board. Sure. So we'll pick it up. Um, would you talk about the next few, me few meetings mm -hmm. in series um, and bring us up to the point where the switch became central to conversation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think all of this work that happened now from the formation of IMG onwards to the switch a couple of years later, I think was the foundation for the facilitate the switch. Uh, I mean, there was an intense level of effort happening. Uh, so the IMG was you know very high level, right? And only met, checked in every six months. But each one of the work groups there were six that I mentioned and five, uh, you know, ultimately two coalesced together. They met, uh, depending on their terms of reference, I think on a weekly basis for the most part uh, by telephone and then periodically depending on their board level of work in person. In terms of your involvement, what which calls were you on on a weekly basis? Yeah, so we at the task force, we didn't really talk about it, but we had a group of people. I mean, it was set up. Uh, I did ultimately end up going there, by the way. Uh, and, right, we need to resolve that. Yeah, as coordinator of that uh, support. And we had, I think, 12 or so people uh, in total and but, uh, several people in country at different times that we had contracted. Um you know, this, so the scientific expertise, Walt, who sat on a bunch of groups, Alan, the programmatic side. And then we had a project manager who also supported. Uh, she owned, for lack of a better word, the work plan for the IMG. So she was in charge of tracking it and, uh, you know, the timelines and following up with people on accountability. Uh, accountability. Yeah. And uh, accountability was, I think, all, uh, the secretariat was at WHO the official secretariat uh, and Simona, and she coordinated all of this. But I think Chantel's job, Chantel Vera, wonderful person who, you know, helped gather all that information for Chantel to actually, uh, hey, you know, when is this work completed? Is it done? Why not? And those sort of things. And so that was part of it. We had a communications director who was who led the communications work group. So we had a series of folks here at the task force. Um, my myself, uh, I was on the country implementation into com country implementation work group, uh, which was a very important group uh, <laughs> for actually executing all this. And then there was, I was partly on the communication work group initially. I had a fair amount of uh, involvement, and then the regulatory. And then we had uh, some folks from the task force on the financial group, 
And uh, we also had uh, the routine immunization work group, which was also uh, very important uh, for IMG. Alan set on that. So we had all the work groups covered. In, within task force? Within the task force. And then each agency had a representative and an alternate. Could you give me a sense? Uh, also, each one of the regional offices from both UNICEF and WHO were represented on these different work groups, specifically the country implementation work group. Sorry, not all the work groups, the country implementation work group, which was crucial, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the country implementation work group, mm -hmm. um, could you give us a sense of what your work was like on a daily basis? What were you doing? <laughs> what were you thinking about? Yeah, yeah. You know, in retrospect, I think it turned out to be fine the way it was, our role. Uh, so first of all, I, I think pretty much we had to create our own role at this point uh, uh, because we weren't official members of, you know, GPEI. And that makes sense. You know, if you make us members, then why not, you know, some other group and lots of people have it. So it made sense. So we were there as supporters and uh, we were... Basically, can doers, you know. Uh, I would say there was a lot of strategy happening at this point, but implementation wise, uh, it, it, you know, like if an idea came up, what, who was going to do it? And there weren't, weren't like people jumping up and down on those work groups saying, I'll do it, I'll do it. And for good reason, I think, you know, there were representatives from each one of the agencies, but they weren't like full time dedicated people that you're just going to do this for the next two years. Uh, they had their own jobs and passions, I guess, back home. <laughs> but they had tremendous experience. And so, you know, for instance, on the country implementation work group, uh, I mean, first big question was, you know, of all these countries, who are the ones who are going to introduce first? What can we learn? Uh, can we do a pilot introduction of IPV in a few countries and see if we, I mean, there's all sorts of ideas that, uh, you know, were generated. And so one of the specific, ta I, I would, not just me, for, but my role on the country, country implementation group was to take on some of those tasks because I was fully funded for that. Uh, and I think that worked out really well. You know, uh, I don't know if that's what was anticipated, but it certainly helped, I think. So specifically, if, for example, uh, there was a pilot uh, a introduction idea. Let's introduce IPV into a country, an early willing introducer, and see what are the challenges that come up and document those so that other countries can have them. So I would draft up, you know, a protocol for that, for instance. Um, Did these protocols change very much as time went on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of these were like living documents and we would modify them. Um, so a lot of specific, specifics of document. we drafted a lot of documents, I would say, you know, consuming the science and translating it and making it all available for these countries to adapt it for their own, for partners, to, you know, slide decks for partners so they can go use them in different places. I made tons and tons of slide decks of all this information and in different, you know, for different audiences, for different. Uh, <laughs> Who were, could you highlight some of the audiences and any kind of um, specific particular thought and consideration yeah. you had to give yeah. in preparing materials yeah. for specific audiences? Yeah. And that was, again, there's a lot of literature on this and work on the new vaccine introduction to think through this. A lot of thinking went into this, mm -hmm. who the audience is at this stage, you know? Right. So we can so, go to the documents for that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That will be definitely be, there's some stuff for the archive. <laughs> so it was very high level, you know, so the audiences at this point we felt were country decision makers as one of the biggest audiences to introduce IPV. And what we called NITAGs, National Immunization Technical Advisory Groups. Um, so we came up with a NITAG kit, for instance, you know, with 10 different, uh, you know, published material as well as, you know, how to actually introduce the vaccine and what are the logistical steps, what are the cold chain implications, a communications toolkit, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things uh, specific to IPV. What kinds of feedback did you get on these toolkits? That's another wonderful question. Yeah, so, you know, we didn't know. Uh, how do we test these? There was, so funny thing, um, let's see, I think June, we met in June. The first application deadline was September. Gabby came on board officially and opened up their application window for 
No, it was in February. I'm sorry. I, I might be getting these wrong. Was when Gabby came in? No, no, no. They came on in September, October, somewhere along that. Officially, you know, I think they blessed their mechanism. And they have a approval mechanism. A country puts together an uh, application to submit to Gabby, and then Gabby has a committee that reviews it, and then they say yay, nay. If yay, then uh, these are the, you know, this is how we'll get the vaccine to you. Uh, and that application process is, you know, not just simple. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it requires some work uh, by the country. Um, so February was the first window. They have windows. So it's just like getting into college, you know, several <laughs> application cycles. So February, they have three application cycles, maybe, I think in 2014. So February was the first one, say, uh, you can fact check me, but uh, so let's say February and- uh, 2014? 2014, right. Okay. Um, and you know, 73 countries I think were eligible to apply and we were anticipating, you know, big load of them to come in, you know, and I think we had a big goose egg. Nobody had applied in February. So obviously demand was a issue, right? How do you generate demand and how do you get these, you know, how do we, translate all this stuff that's in our room and our strategy to the countries. How do we bridge that? And so we spent a lot of time thinking and uh, implementing that part. To generate demand. To generate demand, to get it, all this down to the country folks and, hey, this is available, this is the mechanism, this is how we're gonna do it. What support do you need? How can we get it to you? Uh, you know, uh, figuring it out at a country level. We did, I mean, night and day we would think about that. Uh, during that, especially, I think February was sort of a wake up call. Like we really need to do something and get it motivated. And where was this, where was feedback coming from? So uh, th we did many things I would say th to highlight. Um, so I, I can focus on, I mean, all the partners did their own things, right? So one is uh, highest level communications. So Dra letters were drafted by the uh, DG of WHO, for instance, to send out to each one of the um, country uh, leaders. But I'm, I'm thinking of feedback on on the work that you had done, feedback on the toolkits and reviews of the Correct. Toolkits. Yeah, I, I jumped. Uh, this is all we had, right, and how to get that feedback. Uh -huh. First was how to get it, get it to the country. So feedback comes from various levels. There was an internal clearance mechanism. I would send it to each one of the IMG groups, and, you know, 50, 60 people in total with all the small work groups and whatnot, and give them a deadline and, you know. Go through um, that process. Go through that process. And ultimately, uh, the IMG itself would approve it. It was sort of, I think, an ad hoc process we'd come up with and worked pretty well. And in that was also country uh, uh, representation through the regional offices, so because they were closer to the countries, they knew what the countries might need. Um, so we came up with uh, material. The other was uh, we set up uh, webinars. Uh -huh. uh, in these webinars, you know, uh, there were a whole host of issues with that, but we they ended up being successful. Ultimately, we did a bunch of them. I can't uh, countless numbers to different audiences. We would invite, you know, countries and the regional offices and people who had more of a reality check in countries, partners, stakeholders, other groups who worked in immunizations, PATH, JSI. Um, JSI? It, it, John, it, they go by JSI, another one, I believe, but I think it started out as John Snow Institute, maybe. Uh, it's a, it, they're, they do a lot of in-country implementation work on immunization systems. Uh, Tremendous group, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, they directly support countries. Um, kind of like UNICEF? No, 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 not uh, NGO, I will, not, you know, a non governmental organization. Um, uh, UNICEF, of course, has country presence, but they, you know, have their own official relationships and whatnot. I mean, I think these are, you know, it's a different more, entity. Different entity, more freedom, more uh, intellectual freedom and operational freedom. And, you know, they can do projects, take on projects, direct country support. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, so at any rate, these webinars were, I think in retrospect, turned out to be a great platform for test driving a lot of our materials. Cause we would present it and, you know, we would get feedback from all these different people and we would modify it. So it's two ways. It's one, it was a way to get feedback, but also to get this information out. So we really broadly disseminated the stuff to try to just get it out there. 
um, Walt and I did a Metscape interview. Uh, that was, a, you know, there's all sorts of different things. And then of course, country meetings, as I mentioned, you know, high level letters, but then there are these EPI manager meetings for each country that are uh, for each region. And so we would have broad representation from the IMG at each one of these meetings. So we strategically mapped them out and ensured that we were there, that we were presenting. Uh, questions were in lots and lots of countries, had lots of questions. And that would, would take that back. We had a repository of people bringing stuff back and we would you know, modify our information based on that. How large was your team? Uh, within the task force or? Um, within the with, country implementation. Oh, so country implementation. I mean, it, the calls, you know, would, there were lots of people on there. Each one of the WHO regional offices would have one or two persons. UNICEF would have one or two persons. So you're saying at least 30 people there. Yeah, each one of the organizations had a couple of people. So I would say, you know, probably 40, 40, 50 people, but calls were much, you know, I mean, s smaller depending on who was available, uh, what time of the year it was. And there was a core group that regularly attended. And uh, as I said, I think, you know, as far as, uh, uh, there were definitely a smaller core group who actually um, implemented the recommendations. Uh, Are there any and, major decisions that you remember making as a group that stirred more discussion than usual where I'm looking for disagreements or moments where. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no, I, I, I think in retrospect, it, one of the reasons for successes for all this was the people. And I would say there were at least the ones who attended the calls, very optimistic, can do positive people who wanted to make this happen. Yeah, there were realistic people and there were people who would throw, you know, a little realism of, you know, you guys are crazy. Uh, <laughs> this is how it really works in country. But it was always still, what can I do to try to make it happen? So uh, I would say the dis major disagreements, not really. Um, I, and I think it was, again, started from the top down. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a these weren't diplomatic groups. So Michel Zafran led that group, for instance. He led IMG, but also country implementation initially. And what I've observed is, you know, he's very direct. As opposed to in public health, we tend to, you know, walk on eggshells sometimes. And, you know, in, in this setting, it worked out really well. So he's very direct, but also, you know, very open to hearing everybody. And he would, you know, he would call you out by name and say, Manish, what do you think about this if nobody said anything? So it was a two-way thing. And he did foster a sense of, you know, um, a trust, I think. And he, I don't think you ever felt the sense that he was representing WHO. It was more like IMG was a group in and of itself. I think, you know, and that, I think, filtered down. Or maybe the people were just, that's how the people were. I don't know if it was Michelle's work. But yeah, I think both, it worked out well. So there wasn't that much like agency disagreements, I would say. People, yeah, of course, different have, people had different ideas. So specifics, there were lots of challenges. So one big challenge that came up was supply shortages. We were, I mean, we didn't even talk about supply issues initially because we were told and promised by the companies that we would have ample supply to meet that supply demand forecast of 450 million doses, I think is what we had, and, you know, our base scenario for three or four years and no problem. Uh, and I don't know if you know, and I'm sure you know through your aid interviews, that has been the biggest challenge was the huge supply shortages. Uh, so there were challenges, how to address that? Uh, again, there were no big disagreements, but there were opinions on that. And I think we resolved it the best we could. What were some of the opinions? So I think one of the biggest things initially uh, uh, related, well, it had to do with communications, you know. Uh, in the regional offices oftentimes, of course, were telling us, you know, the, the countries really want a more a, a stronger uh, uh, sense of assurance that they're going to have this supply, not that they've committed to it. They've spent all this time convincing their decision makers, allocating funds, 
doing the training and now all of a sudden there's no supply. You know, we need to communicate it to them sooner or faster. Why? You guys said it's so important to introduce IPV, but now you're saying, well, it's it's okay. We have supply shortages, but we'll be okay for no supply for a year. It's, now we're sort of backtracking a little bit. I'll, you know, is it not that important? Why didn't you say that up front? You know, so how to communicate, when to communicate. Uh, on the flip side for IMG, I mean, yeah, the supply situation was always changing. So to firmly go out and communicate and say, yep, it's this is the how much we have. In three months, we'll have more was a challenge because they didn't have that information. So, you know, the, those were, but I don't think, I mean, I, it was always in a very uh, collegial environment. Uh, and we came to, I think, good agreements uh, through frequent calls and feedback from the regions and ultimately the countries on what they need. And there were some face-to-face uh, -face meetings as There well? were many face-to-face -face meetings on this. I mean, not any one specific that comes to mind, yeah. And then meetings, of course, with the pharmacy, with the pharmaceutical agencies, you know. Um, so one huge issue that helped solve or at least soften the blow was uh, what we call the multi-dose vial policy. Uh, initially, because we had no supply, the vaccine itself has a, um, not a shelf life, but has to be, once it's opened, the vial has to be used or discarded within six hours um, because supposedly that it wouldn't be preserved enough to last beyond that, even if you put it back in the fridge. Does that result in high wastage? Yeah, high wastage. Uh, so you basically throw away a big chunk. And we expected that waste to be high initially and weren't too concerned about it. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, there were data that were available, uh, you know, not strong data, but some data suggested, you know, there was a preservative that would allow you to keep it longer. The other, there's a multi-dose vial policy. So it's six hours or 28 days. There's nothing in between. Huh. Wow. The, if you have preservative of sufficient quality, then you could keep it for 28 days. And so, you know, the global policy on this, and it's communicated and used worldwide by most countries, is you can take the six hours or accept the multi-dose vial policy for the ones that have that, but there's not like a 14 day. 28 days is probably too long because you probably use it up in a few days. Some countries, maybe a week or two, but very few, you know, uh, you don't need 28 days. Uh, but, you know, there's no, I guess, data or even if there are data, it becomes too confusing to have like a seven day vial policy and a 14 day vial policy. So I don't think there was an appetite for having a middle of the road multi-dose vial policy for IPV specifically. It's too confusing is sort of the general sense, right? I mean, in country year, I've got a seven day vial, I've got a 14 day open vial, you know, and all that kind of implementation is difficult. Mm -hmm. But there were data suggesting that you could have something for the IPV. But we never even thought about it, talked about it. As it turned out, Brazil, before the IMG had formed, had introduced IPV, single dose vial, and they had ran into stockouts of the vaccine in country because of the six hour rule and the high wastage. So they looked at these data and said, oh, we can have a seven day multi-dose vial policy. And they, you know, you're talking about wastage of 30, 40, 50% or something that comes down to zero, nearly zero, whatever, three, 4% or, you know, minimal, just routine wastage. And, uh, you know, halted their supply issues because of that. Uh, not widely known, but I'd somehow heard about it and circulated that to the group. But I think, you know, at the time, nobody really just even wanted to talk about that because it wasn't open for a global policy change because there's no supply issues with IPV. Uh, three, four months, six months later, when we started getting the supply <laughs> scares, I think that prompted uh, looking at this multi-dose vial policy and this specific preservative to phenoxyethanol. Is it sufficient preservative for IPV? And I think they did some studies or at least re-looked at some of the existing data. And ultimately, a year or so later, a year and a half later, there was an official stamp of approval through the regulatory label changes and so forth that, yes, we can apply the multi-dose vial policy, which helped a lot with the supply. Because uh -huh. you're just not wasting as much. Just not wasting as much. So, I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, it, that that took 
a long time, but you know, uh, each WHO specifically, I think, did a lot of work working with the, the regulatory folks mm -hmm. to try to make that happen. Uh, another big issue was multi-dose, I mean, multiple injections, sorry. You know, um, traditionally, the kids have only gotten one vaccine. Uh, um, pneumococcal against pneumonia was a second vaccine. And now you've got IPV, which is a third vaccine. So uh, US, we give six, seven, eight. But when 19, late 1990s, early 2000, when the had the upswing in number of doses, there was an outcry by parents and providers that, you know, so many injections. Obviously just for the pain, because the kid gets a lot of pain, but also, you know, people have thought of, hey, if we're injecting too many viruses or, uh, or was there or, a concern that cis immune ch children's immune systems would all be all sorts overloaded? of different issues, and so the all whole body of evidence was generated to address those uh, issues, see if that was really a concern. And as it turns out, it's not a, a issue uh, in a nutshell from a science perspective. Uh, uh, there is still obviously an acceptability issue, you know, a parent seeing their child, you know, injected six, seven times uh, can't be good from a child. I'm sure it's not great. But the alternative is you, one is don't vaccinate, and then you're at a risk of a disease. Uh, the other alternative is you bring them back on separate days. You can imagine the inconvenience of that, and then that's not going to stop the pain. They're still going to get the shot. So, you know, those uh, different in presenting that to focus groups and whatnot, and, you know, pediatricians and family practice doctors and nurses and vaccinators and parents. Uh, the, the summary of all that uh, was that parents accept it if the pediatricians seem to accept it, you know, if they find it to be necessary. Um, it, yeah. And you give them all these, you know what I mean? Informed decision making. Uh, it, this didn't have. This was never done in any of the developing countries because it wasn't an issue. They were just getting one injection for years and years. So second and third injections. I mean, I'm talking about big outcry against this. You were asking about, uh, you know, uh, differences of opinion was on this specific issue. Uh, and so we generated. We looked at all this information from developed countries, U.S. particularly, and any middle-income, low-income countries. Um, and found a big gap, made recommendations that, you know, quick assessments had to be done. CDC had done assessments now or planned assessments in each one of the regions as a result of this. Uh, we collated all this information, body of evidence that's out there as a group and presented it to SAGE. SAGE, you know, re-looked at it and agreed uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, third injection uh, would not be harmful, one, and two, is generally accepted by parents and providers. Because at this point, all the hesitancy was really at a high level because parents hadn't even gotten a chance to think about that. Pediatricians hadn't even got a chance to think about it. Vaccinators hadn't. I mean, we were talking about decision-making level. Uh, In-country PI managers were, you know, the roadblocks, if you will. Uh, uh, the stewards of, you know, their <laughs> customers and country, and they we're anticipating big problems. So we would present this information. Uh, um, it, it, it was a huge challenge. We didn't really anticipate it to be a big challenge initially, but it turned out to be a big challenge. And I think we put together lots and lots of materials uh, f to address this. And uh, I think it was successful. It helped because all countries uh, took on the vaccines. And when was that? When was that body of evidence produced? Uh, so, you know, the first hint of it was some of these meetings we would go to in the countries. Uh, for example, I went to Nigeria, Bhutan, and Bangladesh very early on in 2013. And, uh, you know, everybody I talked to, they didn't want to know how much it's going to cost or <laughs> why are you giving it at this age? Why are you giving it? You're giving three, third injection. No, that's not possible. That was always the first thing you would hear from everyone. And, you know, it was like, well you know, an eye-opening uh, almost uh, event, I would say. And soon, you know, I think we, when I, folks on IMG, all of us started hearing that more and more, we recognized, hey, this is a real problem. We got to address this. So I think early 2000, and we put together, you know, CDC led this uh, review here. Uh, 
I think early 2014 is when it was presented to Sage, April of 2014. But I would say September, October of 2013 is when I first started drafting some of the material. And then the communications group uh, did a lot of the work. We'd, uh, UNICEF did a focus survey uh, in Kenya, I believe, Tanzania, and another country, South Africa had done a study. The CDC started doing it, but still ongoing. I mean, we haven't finished that work yet, but uh, the body of evidence, the synthesis, synthesis, the lay of the land literature search was completed uh, and presented to SAGE in April of 2014. To determine how many vac vaccines, injections? Is acceptable. Too many. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, there, and I mean, there's still a paucity of evidence from these countries. So the more the merrier as they go down. But I think so far, generally, it's acceptable if you communicate appropriately to all levels, you know, uh, the risks and the benefits and those sort of things, as opposed to just saying, nope, it's safe. <laughs> so that's up to 2014. <clears throat> You get the okay mm -hmm. on the number of vaccines, right? Yeah, we get okay. That was a big roadblock. I think that uh, was, uh, you know, always still a problem. But we were doing a better job of communicating all this information uh, uh, really well. And I think it was also helping us build trust with the regions and the countries that we were doing this, you know, in a, a systematic and a, a, as much of an unbiased manner as possible. Um, the multi-dose vial policy was a huge uh uh, help. Uh, there was a financial uh, working group uh, resolution, I guess you could say. Middle income countries was a big barrier. We had all these 73 countries supported by Gavi, but then another 54 or whatever, 51, 48 mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. that were middle income that would fund themselves. First of all, where do they get the vaccine from? You know, they usually uh, have a direct contract tender with the co companies. So we're not involved necessarily, you know, from a global level, because the other one, we have information in UNICEF, because the tender process is through UNICEF and through Gavi. So how these, do we yeah, initiate these, that work? What did they have to do? What did the middle income countries have to do? So biggest is first decision making. I mean, they got to fund themselves, right, for this vaccine. This is a mandate from the global leaders, you know, that we you need to introduce IPV. They don't have polio. They've got diarrhea and pneumonia killing their kids. Why do I'm already giving OPV and it's working fine? I've not seen a polio case in 20 years in my country here in Thailand. Uh, why do I need to purchase vaccine, which, you know, of course is a dollar 81 cents or whatever, up to $2 or $3 a dose that Gabby's funding. But for me, that price is going to be with the manufacturer. They may charge me five, ten dollars. I don't know. Why do I need? You know what I mean? So the <clears> negotiation <throat> is different. They have to negotiate their own prices. Their own prices. Uh, but biggest is decision making. Why do I need? You know, how do I go to my minister of finance, <laughs> convince him that you know instead of buying school buses, he's got to buy you know a new vaccine for a disease that's gone? Uh, so we had really. I mean. Again, it was prioritizing, you know, first was obviously getting this big body of work in the highest need countries, the ones with the greatest risk of polio disease. Um, and they, they tend to be Gavi countries. But then the middle income countries are also, I mean, you know, polio is polio. It can come back anywhere and cause equal harm. Uh, so how do we address them was the issue. And the biggest uh, way to address that was uh, through providing financing from GPEI. So the financing group came up with a plan for that. For the uh, middle income countries. For the middle income countries. Like, yeah, I can't remember details of it at this point, but the uh, okay. tiering system and how much money for each one of the countries and for introduction grants, the operational side of things. We did a little project to figure out what would be the operational costs of introducing for these countries, you know? Mm -hmm. From the perspective of an eradicator, mm -hmm. um, were there different weights you assigned to mm -hmm. different regions mm -hmm. based on risk? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now, now that's, that sparks my memory and actually, yeah, that might have been a contentious topic as well. So uh, yeah, one of the early works we did was t uh, conduct a tiering system for the countries. 
So all 120 some countries were put in a tiering system of one through four, the tier one being the highest. And there were 14 countries, if I remember correctly, were the highest tier. Um, and that tiering, you know, was based on coverage. Of what is their current coverage based on their risk of polio? And that was based on climate. What was that based <clears throat> their, on? The polio and itself. Okay. No, no coverage is. Yeah, I mean coverage is a good measure. I think it's a strong measure in country of their systems in general. So you know, they, if they have a high risk of polio, uh, uh, Pakistan, and low immunization coverage, they automatically make it tier one. It is indirectly, it tends to be in countries with, you know, the lowest, uh, uh, highest amount of disease burden of everything, diarrhea, pneumonia, polio. But I think the specific countries that polio exists right now tends to be more civil conflict areas than anything else where we can't get in to vaccinate. Um, but typically before that, you're totally right. Uh, so we came up with the tiering system, but there was always some, you know, oh, you know, whenever you have tiers, it automatically creates some, you know, if IPV is needed everywhere, <laughs> why am I, you know, on tier four, right? Uh, if you're saying you truly want it everywhere. But I think this was an internal classification system we had. We did share it initially, you know, through some of these meetings, and it was not well received, I think, uh, not by everybody, but, you know, by, there were always people who had some... Uh, uh, Feelings, feelings uh, <laughs> if you will, uh, against it. And so I think, you know, it sort of became an internal living thing that if we would need it, we would keep it. We weren't really using it for anything at that point because we weren't introducing IPV everywhere. So the biggest test, well, first test was uh, uh, the money when we created this mechanism for f uh, funding middle-income countries uh, by tiering. It didn't go over totally well, but we had to have some mechanism because there wasn't, you know, uh, an infinite pot of funds. There was a finite amount of money that we had to make a case to the donors and to GPEI. Um, and so with that, we had to, uh, you know, parse out that money amongst the 50 some countries. Is it appropriate to think of that as um, their programs being subsidized? The, exactly. It was providing a subsidy. Um, Catalytic funds, I believe, is something we uh, was a term we had used, uh, you know. And then, of course, the highest tier would get the highest amount, lowest tier would get the lowest amount. Got it. And so, from there, so that was the first test, uh, and we applied that successfully. I mean, I think that was a pretty good model because we had to have something that was not arbitrary, that was you know evidence based and need based. Mm -hmm. And then we applied that also for the switch funding um, uh, also, and some of the support that we would provide to countries on cold chain, for example, and different things. So the cheering helped, and it's still in play mm -hmm. today. So at this point in time, are we still in 2014? I'm heading toward November yeah. 2015. Yeah, yeah. The so only thing I would say is now we're getting much better. Uh, I, you know, all of this, these were some of the big roadblocks and challenges. In February, I said there was a goose egg. And then I think the next meeting, uh, April maybe, May, uh, late spring, and we had a lot more applications. And I think, you know, some of the successful factors were we went to countries specifically that we knew would be interested or suspected would be interested and we built up that support further you know have some early wins you might say nigeria bhutan uh, uh bangladesh uh, you know uh, there were several bunch of countries that we directly would uh, and we provided them consultant support to help uh, with the we drafted applications for gavi so we have templates and to this day, I think uh, all the uh, uh, applications we received pretty much were of the initial country <laughs> submissions, you know, a different version, cut and paste of you know, the country, so to speak. Trying to streamline it. Trying to streamline it. And I think that helped, you know, try. There's some language that's necessary and some format, and then you uh, apply it to your country context. Mm -hmm. So that helped a lot. And we had, I think, a number of countries apply in the second and many more in the third round. So 2014 was a banner year, I think, for IPV introduction. When the train got moving, it kept rolling. 
And this was before the supply uh, problems. So I think, you know, then we started feeling really, really good come to uh, end of 2014 and almost started getting a sense, uh, you know, that we were going to do this, that IPV is going to be introduced just based on the uh, motivation. Of course, there were uh, a number of countries that we still had challenges in that uh, we would have a one-on-one -on -one approach with the country to try to help resolve whatever it was, mm -hmm. typically at the decision-making level. Or some of which, which countries were some of the first? <laughs> In April. <laughs> in a, so uh, the application, Nigeria was one of the first ones. Okay. Yeah, I distinctly remember going to Nigeria to do help uh, them. Wonderful place. Uh, and, you know, again, it's always the people I found. Uh, you know, it's, you say Nigeria, but there's literally one or two persons who made that happen. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Nigeria has a, obviously a huge polio presence and, uh, you know, uh, an endemic country still to this day. And they've always been seen as the last to possibly eradicate polio historically because of their large outbreak in the mid 2000s that spread internationally. And so I think, you know, there was this, they wanted to eradicate polio and there's lots of support that they've had and uh, over the past uh, number of years from CDC, we've got a, you know, a huge Nigeria presence and a Nigeria team and then Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have people in country uh, and obviously WHO and UNICEF, but Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, had direct uh, communication with the highest level person, Dr. Addo, Dr. Mahmoud in Nigeria, and uh, they were very eager to introduce IPV uh, from, a, I mean, very knowledgeable folks who were convinced that IPV would help them eradicate polio. And they wanted to be one of the first countries to do this, you know, they were tired of being lashed. And again, my interpretation, nothing written in stone, but so there was a lot of motivation there. And uh, said, they sort of hooked me up and said, you know, Manish, would you go to the country and meet Dr. Addo and Dr. Mahmoud? And it was overnight practically uh, for IPV. And at this point we had no countries introducing or even interested. And yeah, I packed my bags and went. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was going to do there. And if you've been to Nigeria, it's typically how it works. I mean, you know, it's not like something you have weeks of conference calls and uh, meeting itinerary and plans of what you're going to do. Apparently, things work after you get there. And I went there not knowing who I was going to meet. Uh, <laughs> So what happened? Uh, yeah, I met uh, Dr. Mahmoud, who at the time was director of NPHCDA, the EPI program there, and uh, Dr. Otto, uh, who was you know his boss, uh, and they were very. They wanted to hear you know what are the pros and cons of introducing IPV. Let's and they have mechanism in country of you know this ICC interagency coordinating committee and their an, uh, advisory group, their NITAG, and you know let's put together, you know, and Dr. Mahmoud is very, uh, had a lot of constructive criticism. He wanted to hear, you know, the pitch first. So I gave him the pitch, all this information. And this is, I can't remember, maybe February uh, is when I went. Of 2015? Yeah, I think, maybe even late 2013. Um, at any rate, uh, all this stuff we had developed, I had kind of, you know, presented to him several times uh, in this group of folks. And this was our first, my first, I think, uh, within the IMG, our first interaction with a country. And so a lot of good feedback, positives. And I think overall, they were just very, they were happy to introduce. And we you know, addressed all the issues. And I stayed there two weeks and I helped them draft the plan for Gabby uh, with you know specific folks within his group. We presented it to the ICC, and they said yay, and, uh, and it's history. And we had a pretty nice plan, and that plan we circulated. <laughs> so the other thing, that good thing that came out of that was uh, they have the, the EPI manager meetings that I mentioned. Uh, Africa has three, based on the three regions. And Nigeria, uh, soon after that, presented this work at that meeting. And so that, I think, was super well received by the other countries because, you know, it was one of their own countries who had thought through all these logistical issues of introducing IPV at a country level as opposed to just all the 
global hoorah. <laughs> so what happened after you came back from Nigeria? Yeah. What happened from that? So other things, I mean, we had a lot. So Bangladesh, I had gone to Bangladesh with uh, Karsten Mantel, who was, he's retired since from WHO, but he was the new vaccine introduction counterpart. I mean, the expert for new vaccine introduction at WHO and globally, you know, wrote on Numo HPV, the operational side of things. And uh, both of us went and Bangladesh uh, has a pretty hardcore uh, NITAG the advisory group. Yeah, you have to go through them before the decision is made. And uh, there's some powerful voices on there, pediatricians, you know, the chair and all sorts of, and we presented to them. And there were lots of issues. Multiple injections was a big one that came up from that meeting. Uh, and they, and then, you know, they put together the plan and we supported them. And Bangladesh was one of the early introducers. Uh, went to Bhutan, that was an early introducer. Um, it's a bunch of big countries. We went to India. India, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Jacob John and bunch, many other. I mean, India is a big country to name one person. However, IPV has a long history in India, and there are a lot of IPVers. And so there's a big, strong support. But still, within the government itself, you know, there's uh, decision making steps that are quite arduous, and, and they took on the decision, which was a big win. Indonesia, there was a, a WHO team went to Indonesia and they, you know, we had sent them all this material, I think from the polio eradication team had gone there. It's a big country, fourth largest country in the world. Um, they had taken all this material we had developed um, and sort of, you know, used it at a country level or implement, and that I think sounding board, I guess you could say in country, and that was uh, positively received. So, you know, we started getting good feeling, good vibe that, hey, all this stuff we had done, you know, we probably had made too much. <laughs> over to be overprepared. Oh, yeah, but it was helpful, uh, and we were modifying it. And so, and then, of course, as I mentioned, some of these other issues were getting worked out. So IPV was, I think, in the bag, you could say, uh, we, we were feeling that this was getting better minus the supply situation, which came up later. And when did the supply situation come up? I, I think it was all through 2014. It was creeping on us. Uh, but towards the end of 2014, it was big, I think. I'll have to look it up. Um, definitely 15 was a, when we had to really start, you know, uh, withholding vaccine from certain countries uh, in preference for others through the tiering mechanism. Um, the countries that had even, you know, gone through and uh, done all the training and were had dates selected for introduction and so on and so forth, and there were delays. So this is when I think, you know, you, now I think probably what you were most interested in was the switch. Are we there? Uh, well, it, 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 I remember at a meeting in close to 2014, Apurva Malayala, uh, the same person called me, I remember him. He probably was the first person who was... Uh, very nervous about the switch and got up and said, you know, this is great and this is wonderful. Uh, I'm totally amazed. Uh, but one thing that we haven't really talked about is the switch. I'm getting nervous about it. And, you know, nobody talked about it up until then. And I think that's that probably his concern. Obviously, he's a donor, represents a donor agency, you know, and then their voices uh, uh, carry a lot of weight. He's not speaking for himself, but an entire agency. And so that reflects, you know, a level of anxiety about a work stream that's very important. Uh, and that motivated, I think, you know, putting together a work group, subgroup, I guess you could call it, within the implementation group that thought through and be ultimately uh, led uh, from a global level the switch. Who was in that group? So uh, it was a small group. Uh, so myself, uh, the chair of the group was uh, this wonderful man, uh, uh, highly energetic, a uh, lot of country experience, Alejandro Ramirez Gonzalez. That's his name. Same. Yeah, absolutely uh, would be worth speaking to him, get his perspective. He uh, was the leader of the group. Uh, then we had uh, Lee Hampton from CDC, again, a remarkable person, uh, his depth of history. He was a history major at Harvard, and then yeah, became a pediatrician and came to CDC. Uh, but he has, I think, as near a photographic memory as I've ever seen. And for his, 
thesis or personal interest in college as an undergrad, he looked at polio eradication. I, you know, I must have been like 19 or something. I don't know. <laughs> I was talking about a person who has no long-term plans. He, I mean, this is a complete opposite. He knew he wanted to be in polio eradication at a young age. And so he knew everything about it. And so he, and he was always very impressive to us. The reason I mentioned that, uh, um, and there, there were a series of country level folks there from each one of the regions. Uh, and they were crucial, I'm not mentioning their names Sunil Bell, Christina Pedrera from Pajo. I mean, a whole host of uh, folks, Kamal Fami. Uh, so it was a small group ultimately, but uh, 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 maybe initially seven, eight people, persons. And then we had the country folks or the regional folks. So maybe 20 total. Uh, who were involved with the switch from a global and regional level. And so when did you really, when did that group form? <clears throat> uh, end of 2014. Um, I think officially maybe around, just around Christmas time, before Christmas time, maybe November or so, if I remember correctly, by call. And then we, our first meeting was in either January or February of 2015 in Geneva. And was that in preparation for the six month check-in? Yeah, so uh, exactly. So initially the switch at this point, as I mentioned, was one envisaged as one day. Uh, but now I think, you know, when we were starting to give it more thought, there was lots and lots of consternation about that, much more so than the IPV introduction. At this point, nobody was even thinking about IPV. You know, IPV. We, I think we'd almost forgotten how arduous we thought IPV introduction would be. Uh, uh, and, but switch, I think, just you know, it was a Herculean effort compared to the IPV introduction at this point. Uh, you know, and thinking through partly because we knew what it took to introduce vaccine and all the challenges. But for a switch, we just didn't know what that meant. I mean, as a specific task, not something any of us had done or countries had done, and then definitely not on a synchronized level. Um, so it, there were two people working on it initially, uh, and then myself, uh, two people from the core agencies. That was Alejandro. Ramirez? Uh, yeah. Uh, Ramirez, and then myself, uh, this is very unusual, I can't remember, <laughs> a very important person's last name, Hans Evert, I, I believe is his last name, a very important uh, person uh, for the switch. So Hans was a consultant, I believe, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it's, and it's directly and uh, was supporting Alejandro in thinking through what the switch would look like. Uh, and they had drafted an initial sort of, you know, a document. Um, and I've gone through the various agencies and that kind of stuff. Uh, and within that, you know, and this of course reflected the thinking on the switch from the various agencies. Initial thinking was this graphic that uh, should go in the archive that nobody understood could not even explain it to people. Not, and I, I take that, I, I link it with Alejandro and Hans, but it's not them. It, it reflected really the, the highest decision-making on this, on the switch. And the thinking was one day, which got expanded to two weeks, fortunately, as they're thinking through this. So you would have a two week window. But then when would the switch happen? So that date was set for April, as you mentioned, the low season of polio in 2016, hopefully after type two is gone and IPV is introduced. But one of the epidemiologic uh, indicators for the switch, the go ahead, as you mentioned, would be absence of circulating vaccine derived polioviruses, and then persistent circulating vaccine derived polioviruses. So first they said, circulating vaccine to right polioviruses, type two, would be absent for six months. Nowhere in the world would you have those for six months. And those six months would be March of 2015 to September of 2015. 
So if in that time frame you had no CVDPVs, but then they added a word called persistent CVDPVs, they being the you know uh, uh, global body of uh, scientific thinkers on this topic, PCVDPVs is what they called it, new term, which again added another level of you know, explanation. So if there's no PCVDPVs for PCVDPVs type two for six months. Then in September, we would look at that information and give the country the go or no go. That's what they called it. So I'm trying to describe this graphic. So they would have, they would say go. And then that go means you start planning in April. So six months of planning for all these countries to switch within this. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, and then if you have persistent CVDPVs and after that, then you would stop also. So anyway, to try to communicate this to all these, uh, we didn't understand. It was just total failure. Fortunately, I'm not sure how this happened. Uh, you, you know, I think Michelle Zafran probably had a huge part. All of us probably did in just not conveying that this doesn't make any sense. And countries really need a lot of lead time to be able to plan all this out and to secure the BOPVs and all sorts of other detailed steps that have to happen. Even though we don't know what they are, it's going to require at least a year. And we need a year in advance notice. And so that graphic was destroyed and the six month of trigger and go, no go uh, fell by the wayside, which was a big step. And, say, and of course, it wasn't just any one person's decision. This was presented to Sage and Sage said, yes, if in April 2014, there's no persistent CVDPVs at that point, type two, even if there's one or two, which I think there happened to be actually a few months before, that it's sufficient confidence epidemiologically. And we're a year out from this switch date to let the countries know we're going to switch. Unless there's a catastrophe. I think I remember that word even. If there's a, a you know, a, unless there's, you know, massive outbreak of CVDPV side two or a big, you know, not massive, but at least something big would have to change for us to not switch. And countries wanted that because without that, we can't go forward at all. Uh, so it was a huge step. Uh. <laughs> so you've made a plan <clears throat> and it's 2015 at this point, February. 2015. Mm -hmm. At what point did the JID supplement is was it a supplement journal of infectious oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. diseases mm -hmm. come out? Oh, it, that it, volume. It came out this year. No, I'm I'm thinking um, that maybe it was just a single article that was describing the end game that was oh, the New England Journal. Um, there was one New England Journal article we wrote that came out before. Maybe that was it, but the date on it was November 15th is when it was submitted. Of 2015? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the New England Journal article, I believe. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple, two or three articles, and that was one that we tried to submit a lot to get this message and information out to you know, a whole host of audiences through publications as well uh, okay. as one of the communication channels. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot happened on the switch in those six months, even before that first meeting. But really, the first meeting was crucial because before then, you know, so there was six or seven or eight of us on these calls on the switch, and and we were trying to figure out what the switch is in this document that Hans and Alejandro had uh, helped, was very useful because in there they thought through the issues. Now, fundamentally, the issues were one decision making, obviously and understanding what the switch is at a country level. But you know, how do you motivate all these countries to do it simultaneously, synchronized? Any one country, they can do it. Two, three, but how do you get them all? You know, I can get my kids together, I would say, you know, this morning, <laughs> there's three of them. One of them who's like getting 50 countries together. <laughs> but sure it's a lot of work. Yes. Uh, so they had some thought about that. Then what are the specific steps, uh, you know, in this? So that fundamentally, there's issues of financing. Who's going to fund all of the switch activities? Because it's a totally new ball, not something that they include in their budget plans. Uh, there's issues related to supply, so they have to register this new vaccine, BOPV. Most of those countries had not registered it. 
they have to think about how much TOPV they have in the country. TOPV is the vaccine they have to pull. So they typically have one or two year supply. Some have six month supply. So it depends on how much supply they have, how much excess will they have after that switch date that they'll have to pull and destroy. And then to minimize that, fundamentally, it's a balance between having sufficient amount to get to April, uh, but not too much after. And so to do that, you got to kind of tally up all the vaccine in country. And you know, these countries don't have like an electronic system where you can just say, whoop, 2 billion point one three five doses, you know, they have to actually go out and uh, do a survey of all the cold chain facilities to determine how much vaccine uh, they have. So that needs to be done. The training part, uh, the NITAGs, uh, training all the health workers on switching and the advocacy community. So all these little steps and they've come up with a general plan um, from which to work. And what we did was uh, we helped uh, the members of the switch work group took that plan and you know the plan was good and it was great but you know they were working with i think they were handcuffed really by the global policy on this go no go and so there was a lot of confusion in the document a lot of focus on the go no go and trying to explain it and some of the important details were falling apart and not well explained at that initial time uh, and so what this work group did was really you know, felt that if we break each one of these things down into specific parts, sp figure out what are those specific activities, how do we communicate it, what is necessary, what are the gaps, and you know, and so we basically uh, came up with all the details and then presented it at the first time on, in, in Geneva, spent two or three days together, and even got further. And then from there, the next month or two, we spent a lot of time developing, you know, this was good internally, but really you need some more digestible information for out there. And then also a plan of attack. How do we now start? You know, we've got a year. Of course, you can send a letter out to the countries, but you need more than that. You really need meetings and FaceTime to and, and hear them out also. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time doing that in the next several months. When you say we needed time to hear them out, what kinds of things were you needing to hear? Same things we were complaining about at a global level. I mean, the biggest response you would get initially is this is impossible. This is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? Two weeks? We need, you know, six months, one year preparation time? No way. You need at least two, three years. You know, what are the, you know, all sorts of things like that. Uh, I mean, everyone wants a, I mean, these are, when we're talking about countries, what exactly are the countries, right? We're talking about people who are highly trained within a country who have lots of experience with immunization systems in general and had their own experiences, their opinions, <laughs> what's relevant for their country. I mean, you know, can't just pass and stuff and expect them to just take it on. You have to have a platform for, you know, uh, voicing their opinions, their concerns, uh, what support they need, how they feel about it, um, those sort of things. And then of course, for us, uh, a sounding board for all the information we have to, we're all working on the same thing, but you know, we have to come to a nice middle ground. Uh, how do we get there in that short time frame with all 155. So how do you do that? We spent a lot of time. Uh, we did it through various approaches. Uh, you know, first is developing all this materials. You know, we really spent a lot of time uh, getting into a room, closed doors, two, three days, and just uh, swatting it out, I guess you could say, <laughs> and coming up with a bunch of materials. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and then we held webinars again. Uh, as much as I hated those things, uh, we spent a lot. Of <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, I mean, webinars are fine. I think you know, in, in a place where you have great internet connection and good computers and time, and for the audience, uh, we, we found you know we were our audience here was developing countries, you know, and even if regional offices, they were in country and time zone differences. And so, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, different platforms uh, we use, uh, what platforms are good for webinars here might not be good for them. They might not have the software 
we ran into all sorts of challenges. You know, the first time where you could hear somebody's babies crying in the background or traffic, and you can you know can figure out that you could mute all and all sorts of technical challenges. We're not webinar experts, but we fi I think we figured all that out. And by now, we were experts in webinar. One of my friends uh, used to, you know, uh, text me all the time. Uh, how's you know the webinar webinar man going? I think Anchor Man was on at the time. So webinars were huge. I think uh, uh, helped us at this stage for really sounding out our material. I, I think we felt started feeling more confidence about uh, at least a, a better understanding of what was needed for the switch. Second big thing you asked about was the dry run, uh, what we call the dry run. Uh, I'm not sure where this idea came from. Um, and I want to say uh, it was either Dina Pfeiffer in the Euro WHO office or Nadia Taleb. Both of them had mentioned, you know, why don't you guys take all this stuff and go to the country and see, you know, what they think of it. And we called it the dry run, essentially. So we went to India. Uh, India is very eager to do this. And Sunil Behil, uh, I am sure he's on your list uh, of people to interview for polio eradication. He is, you know, the polio eradicator from India and continues to do good things now in the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office for all vaccines. And uh, he was a big proponent of, uh, you know, uh, having a dry run in India. We selected two big states in India, Punjab and Assam. And uh, a dry run essentially was, let's, we, you know, invited all the relevant folks that would be involved with the switch at these meetings in a local level, you know, from decision, highest decision makers down to the vaccinators. Uh, and went through all the specific steps um, in country with them over a week and even went out to the uh, warehouses and the districts where the vaccines are stored and, you know, talked about all sorts of communications materials and training stuff and, you know, got feedback. And let me just tell you, it was, that is when we knew that the switch was feasible. Up until then, we had no idea. I mean, this was just, but when we went to the country and went, you know, there was an affirmation one for all the materials and the thinking we had done all this. Of course, there was, you had to adapt it to the local context, but person after another got up and ultimately would convey that this was totally feasible. And one person in Assam even cried because for them, it signified that we are coming to the end of polio, really coming to the end of <laughs> type two, which is essentially a virus, if you look at it, is eradicated. And that's what, and he got up and, you know, and he'd worked in polio eradication all his life, obviously. So, you know, and, and that, and then we recognize that what exactly is the switch? We didn't know switch. What is the switch? You know, it's a series of act steps that they really do in country all the time. You know, stock management, inventory, training, communicating with the health workers go into their decision making, makers asking for money and making a strong case. All these they do, we just have to put them in a specific sequence and you know, explain it to them that this is what you do. You know, we shouldn't even call it the switch. We should talk about you know, <laughs> an activity within immunizations. And uh, that, was, that really, I think, um, resonated well with us. And uh, you know, I think built confidence and optimism and then we had dry runs in Tanzania, Cameroon, uh, in Mongolia. And, you know, and I think that these things help generate material. Some of these countries like Tanzania had a bunch of other countries come to them. So the, you know, those sort of things uh, helped a lot. Uh, third big step on the switch, uh, huge, was uh, consultant training. We had something very similar with IPV that I left out. Uh, we called it consultant training, but it was really, uh, you know, like I said, so far it was like 20 or so people that are thinking about this at a global level, but we hadn't gotten it out. Or, you know, there's regional office persons, there's country level people, there are stakeholders from different agencies like JSI Path and country, you know, that do a lot of work. 
is we brought all these people to Atlanta at Decatur at the task force. Um, Were you leading? Uh, yeah, Dr. Fagey attended and opened the meeting for us, and it was that was remarkable. Remark. I mean, he's he's remarkable in general. I mean, everyone said that, uh, but you know, he. Uh, I mean, I certainly everybody at CDC. I think you know uh, reflects on his time here, and what he's done, and, and holds him at a, the highest level. Uh, but you know, it was impressive for me to see that these folks who were from the countries. When they found out Dr. Fagey was coming, and nobody knew Dr. Fagey was coming, he was a surprise guest. <laughs> and Dr. Fagey, as brilliant as he is, came in, I think, you know, 30 minutes before and uh, sat down with me and, you know, took notes on what, and of course, he had his own thing going, but maybe to make me feel better, sat down with me and heard a little bit about the switch, <laughs> which is why the people were there. Uh, and then came in, and I mean, it, Person after another came, and even the ones who didn't know who Dr. Fagey was were impressed. So it was wonderful. What did uh, he say? He started out with a joke, which I think I had actually heard before, uh, <laughs> which I think you know helped break the ice. Uh, I can't remember the details of the joke right now, but at any rate, uh, he you know talked about eradication, of course, and he talked about you know the uh, his it. it if you ever hear Bill Fagey, Dr. Fagey, I mean, every time I've heard him, I leave, and I can't remember details of what he says, because I think he goes in so many different places, but there's such a feeling he leaves behind of cohesiveness and a, some cohesive, you know, message. <laughs> Uh, I think it was basically a sense of optimism of, you know, that eradication, we're here uh, sort of thing. But there were so many little details, nuggets of little stories and how he ties things in, but I can't really remember specifically what he said. It's recorded and should be in the archive. I'll send that to you. I'll have to go back and watch it because I haven't seen it since to see what he said. <laughs> uh, so with that, you know, I think the way I describe that uh, was really, those were our ambassadors. We had about 75 people from like 50 some countries representing different countries, not, you know, through their whatever respective organizations. And uh, they heard about the switch, but they hadn't really been familiar with all this information. And over three days, we went through it with them. We had plan and work groups and ways to get their feedback and input. And you know, I, I think I mean, not just it was because it was held here. It, uh, people, person after person, came and thanked me, uh, and I think felt very appreciative of that meeting because they had this information. Uh, uh, so that was good. And so I think those were the series of large things that I can recall that really pushed the switch work forward. So where does that bring us in time? Uh, yeah, so time-wise, we're towards the end of 2015 now, and now it's implementing the switch, thinking about the actual implementation. I mean, there were a series of other things, you know, specific things, such as disposal. What do we do about disposing the vaccine? You know, from a science perspective, how do we do it? What's the best way to dispose, inactivate this? And by disposal, I'm sorry, you know, we have excess vaccine in April that has to be destroyed. We can't leave it around. There's literally 2 billion doses of TOPV that's been used each year. So, you know, of course, there's going to be less if you manage it adequately. So, But there's going to be still several, several hundred million doses worldwide left over parsed across 155 countries and territories. Uh, what do you do with that vaccine? And there were issues related to countries, you know, they, they don't want to waste vaccine. How do you get them to stop from using it, right? It's, it's some, some countries, it's law, Egypt, for instance, to waste a vaccine. Can and, you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not universal, but uh, yeah, some of these countries got up and said, you know, it's a law. It's You can't uh, just destroy a good product. We've paid for it. You can go to jail for it, and they were concerned. And so, you know, how do you address that situation? Um, I mean, ultimately, they had to come up with their solutions, but, you know, there's good ways of doing that and bad ways of doing it, uh, I think. Um, what do you mean? I mean, you can just let it. Sorry, you got to do it. <laughs> but you know, you, you mean to, from the the side of global? Yeah, we have to. We uh, we have we have to make sure it happens. But then, how do you do it? I mean, and 
you know, we didn't necessarily have money to just buy the vaccine back. And that I don't think was even feasible uh, for various reasons. There were all, all sorts of issues, but, you know, we have to help them think through it and help them, you know, come to the best judgment and uh, make sure that it's done without them, you know, being at risk, whether it's, you know, mid changing the law or amending the law or talking to the right people or sending letters from the highest level to their highest governments, uh, all sorts of, you know, uh, different things that have to happen. Um, uh, but ultimately, all countries did switch. So uh, these challenges were one by one addressed. A question about risk. So mm -hmm. you brought that up just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. At what point did you explain the risks of transitioning, not transitioning, but ceasing OPV3? OPV2 or 3? Three? 3. Phasing out, um, I guess I'm getting at the, the vulnerability in populations mm -hmm. to polio type 2. Um, how, at who, to whom did you explain the risks and how did you explain them? Where did that take place? Uh, different for, different forums, different forums, different people. Uh, I mean, I think you have to explain it to whomever, whenever, wherever you can, so that you create an atmosphere of understanding that, you know, I, my understanding really, it's tough to measure, but there is this gradual dissemination of information, <laughs> and you kind of feel that after a while. Yeah, you know, I'm sure there's a threshold there that's not measurable, but at some point, it you know you, it, it helps. Uh, so whomever, but at least actively, definitely NITAGs, National Immunization Tag Advisory Groups. There were I went to a, a several uh, what are called certification committees. NCCs, National Certification Committees for Polio Eradication. Each country has their own. Regional offices have them. So I went to several regional ones where, you know, these are people who are uh, virologists, leaders in country on polio, uh, some immunization uh, crossover. You know, you know, so those meetings are important. TAG meetings, technical advisory groups. I mentioned that. EPI manager meetings. Uh, uh, and then in country, the, some of the priority countries, India, obviously, like I said, uh, you know, um, some of the big countries uh, have to go. Egypt, uh, uh, um, there were countries, uh, Iran had issues. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Iran, Iraq had, uh, you know, a large stockpile at a national warehouse. So, uh, you know, the director, uh, Michelle Zafran at the time, would meet, you know, at the World Health Assembly with uh, the highest decision makers. So uh, various ways, I think, uh, does that get to your question? In that instance, the risk would have been reintroduction from yeah. the existing OPV. I see what supply. you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess explain. My question is, how did you choose when to address the biological risks of the switch, mm -hmm. or just ending OPV three? use of OPV3. OPV2, like, trivalent OPV. Trivalent, okay, sorry, correct, yeah, I yeah. thought you, OPV3, you mean oh, type three, sorry, yes, I get it now. Yeah, sorry, that I'm was slow. very clumsy. I'm slow, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, eventually I catch on because we do use OPV3, I get it, uh, okay. in the literature as type trivalent. Yeah, my my information is coming from paper. Yes, so that's yes, That's a great example yes. of that. Yeah, again, <laughs> don't do it. We don't do a good job of <laughs> using these appropriately sometimes. Now, um, all along, really, I would say, but, uh, you know, the, that, that's very important. I, I think you're right. Um, and again, credit to Bruce Aylward. I remember in some of his earlier presentations he would have, there was never just a one strategy it was always risk mitigation strategy of five or six key steps of, you know, thinking through like basically SWAT, swatting out everything, you know, what are the risks and how do we mitigate them? So like for the risks of type two, IPD was just one of the risk mitigation things. Um, you know, uh, having a stockpile of type two vaccine was another risk mitigation uh, step containment activities. You know, making sure type two is only in a few labs is another one. Uh, you know, also there were a series of risk mitigation steps, and 
taking type two out and stopping it one day, this IPV situation, our, we, our explanation always was IPV, IPV, IPV. But I think we did a poor job initially in retrospect and we did come back around and start broadening this. Or we should have said, as Bruce had always said, and others at the in the polio program, that were many risk mitigation strategies to prevent type two from coming back, not just IPV. And so when we run into a supply shortage and now we go back and say, and still there are countries that haven't introduced IPV and we've already switched, right? Because that was what we had to do. It was never the intention. <laughs> Even though we got commitment from everybody, we were planned, but supply shortages. But now our message is, well, IPV is one of many risk mitigation strategies. Another one being like stockpile, for instance, you know, to surveillance, making sure that surveillance is strong for type two and all the kind of, you know, there's a whole series of steps that people were working on actively. But that came, you know, it's adaptability we adapted later, but it would have been helpful to use that all along. It's a challenging question. Yeah. Um, could you explain what's happening um, in Syria with cases of VAP, if uh -huh. my information is it's, correct? I think CVDPVs. Okay. VAPs, yeah, always there uh, okay. at a low level risk, but CVDPV outbreaks. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The difference is, you know, uh, the other one has more genetic changes and starts transmitting. VAP typically is in the person. It can be in close family members and contacts as well and in a time window after vaccination. And it mutates within that person. Yeah, a polio, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's this term used uh, by uh, uh, Nathan Deal. He says, in like a lamb, out like a lion. That's oral polio vaccine. In like a lamb, out like a lion. In the same person, it, it mutates, you know, a very fastidious organism that mutates uh, rapidly. And so VAP also has mutations in it, but you know, when you accumulate sufficient mutations in the right place over time, then the, it becomes a vaccine to right polio virus, almost as a continuum, I would think. You know, we use these different acronyms, but you know, we understood it later. And then it, if it becomes sufficient in the right place where it becomes transmissible in the community, it becomes circulating vaccine derived. And it takes about a year or so, you could say. So uh, currently there are cases of, of CVDPV. So it's an outbreak of polio. It's no different than wild polio virus, except mm -hmm. it's vaccine derived. So can you assume that that is a result in Syria um, because people have not been, I mean, type two exists yeah, it's, there. Is it because there's no uh, less immunity to type two uh, due to uh, the switch? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, the outbreak, so there's always risk. So there's no zero risk ever. And this has been modeled out that with IPV, without IPV, with all this stuff in, when you switch, there's going to be a risk of an outbreak. And you know, the, it's tough to quantify that, uh, admittedly. However, some attempt has been made by this modeling group, Kid Risk, and uh, other modelers in different places, such as Imperial College in London. And I think, you know, at least one estimate that I remember is you know, one to 5% or some low level risk of an outbreak after the switch, no matter what you do. In the mitigation strategy for that, that's what I was saying, it has to be multi-pronged. And one of them is having good environmental surveillance, good polio surveillance to pick it up, having the stockpile. So if there is, we can you know, burn it out, having IPV so we can prevent that outbreak from being too large, not 100% coverage, but some coverage so it doesn't get magnified. And we can use IPV in the setting of the outbreak, uh, those kind of things. Uh, so what happens is right around the switch, as I mentioned, one of the triggers was absence of CVDPVs, if you remember, for a certain amount of time for the switch. Now, there's a balance between pragmatic and science. Absence six months, one year, two years, when do you stop? You could go on forever. You have to make a decision at some point. 
as we said uh, uh, earlier, that you know a year seemed like a good enough decision for Sage from a pragmatic perspective because countries need preparation. And one year, I'll tell you, even after the switch, they say is not enough given other priorities. Does that make sense? So you, ideally, you would want no CVDPVs in a country of type two, because what happens is it's really a race. Once you switch, the immunity to type two starts dropping. And the reason it drops is new births are coming in. Children who are born without any immunity to type two, never been vaccinated, never will be. <laughs> and so the you start having more and more children who are unvaccinated, so the immunity drops to type two in the population. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. IPV is intended to stop that, but of course we have no IPV in there uh, in some of these countries. So type two immunity gradually drops off. And the further you get out, the higher the risk for reintroduction. Where that reintroduction happens is from several places. Wild virus could be containment issues. If somebody's storing the virus in a lab and now the immunity's dropped and somehow it makes it out, that's happened before. Uh, it can happen intentionally or you know, unintentionally. A laboratory worker who's working with type two for research purposes gets infected Infection can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. I obviously majority are asymptomatic. In this setting, say if he never even knows he got infected, but he is shedding it in the stool, takes it home to his community, and then transmits it, transmits. Before you know it, you get an outbreak in the setting of a low. That's one way. Another is intentional release. Would that be bioterrorism? Yeah. I mean, I think the the model they think the risk is low, but theoretically still there, right? It's on one the list. Um, then the other risk is circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. So as I mentioned, it's asymptomatic and symptomatic. So if there's an outbreak going, say, in March 2016, if there was an outbreak of CVDPVs, they might have stopped the switch. I think, you know, I said some, something catastrophic had to happen. We didn't define it, but, let, you know, it's the scientific community would have polio scientific advisory group. For Sage would have to decide that you know, hey, there's so many cases of that CVDPV. If there's an outbreak going on and the immunity starts dropping, it can flare up. So the idea was to that go no go was to make sure there's not CVDPVs to a certain extent. But that knowledge base of whether there's no CVDPVs in a country such as Syria, for example, is only as good as the surveillance. We don't have information on everything in the world. We sample, right? Okay. Surveillance is as good as it's going to get. It's pretty solid for polio compared to other diseases, but it's not perfect, not anywhere close to perfect. And especially asymptomatic people. We, we detect cases of polio paralysis, but not cheddars. Except does does environmental surveillance? It does, but that's patchy awkward. and it's tough to interpret, and you know it's very difficult to do. It's, we don't have any in Syria, as far as I know. Maybe there is now, uh, but you know, and it, it's only in limited places. But yeah, that helps augment our decision making capacity. You know, if you detect it, it's environmental surveillance. Uh, in this situation, it's not good. Another follow up um, question about the timing of. Not the switch, but um, vaccinating with IPV on a global scale. Is there, looking back, would there have been any way, except looking back, would there have been any way to have done that sooner in time? The switch? Not the switch, IPV. IPV. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, going back to it. So with the situation with IPV, really, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean I'm mean, i not the best person to ask about that, like person like Dr. Fagey or Walt Ornstein. But, you know, historically, as I mentioned, there's been two camps, right? There's an IPV camp for eradication and OPV. And, of course, you know, the world went with OPV for good reasons. Easy to use, easy to make, uh, cheaper, uh, don't need training, you know, healthcare uh, facilities to administer a shot, those kind of things. Um, you know, others have argued that you need lesser doses, you don't need campaigns, 
even with lower coverage with IPV, you might uh, facilitate uh, eradication faster. And now recently, you know, now there's a body of evidence suggesting both together, not, you know, some countries do use that. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, however, now we're using it not for eradication, as I mentioned, we're really doing it for prevent, sustain the gains of eradication by preventing it from coming back. Uh, uh, My history on when CVDPVs really emerged is not great. So I wonder, as a follow-up question to that. That's another good reason. I'm glad you mentioned that, yeah. Like as those emerged, I wonder if, um, why IPV was not. Yeah. Yeah, and I think discussions changed around that time. Uh, the, and what we're calling the end game now is not what the end game was envisaged, uh, you know, by Dr. Dowdle and Roland Sutter and others who've written about it to 15 years ago. You know, that end game was we would keep using OPV, stop OPV once it eradicated. And then came uh, the Hispaniola outbreak in 2000 that really, you know, OPV is causing this. Uh, and we, you know, there, now we need to rethink the end game. And that's where the IPV situation came in. <coughs> Could it have happened earlier? Yeah, I mean, it certainly would have eased. Uh, I, well, the challenges with IPV are financial. Uh, I mean, who's going to fund? I mean, it's an expensive uh, introduction and then supply situation, you know. Um, to get it at that price, that was the, one of the negotiating factors that we talked about behind the scenes. Uh, uh, the price was very important. I mean, they got it you know, as close to a dollar as possible for the dose, which is, a, my understanding is, uh, very little profit, you know, for these companies. And so, you know, where what's their incentive? You know, these are, uh, yeah, they have to sustain their market, their ability to produce for the market, and those sort of things. So that, that I, I don't think, I mean, that was one of the big roadblocks uh, for IPV, if you were to, who would fund all that IPV for those years? Again, you, I think the argument could be made. You would have, if you were introduced early for eradication purposes, you might have. Re I mean, people are going to argue that, that, but we didn't go that route. <laughs> uh, for end game, I think it would financially it would have been a tough one to so sustain. The, so the timing was more about less about the emergence of CBD PVs and more about being closer to eradication to make IPV switch. Yeah, Not several, switch, but. several. Uh, yeah, it depends on how much time. I mean, in, uh, so there's several decision points. One is type two has been eradicated, or at least last case was in 1999 uh, in India. So no cases since then, wild type two. Uh, CBDPV is the most common one is type two like more than 95% of them in, the, in recent years before the switch. Uh, so, so those are- a target. The, the third thing is the vaccine. TOPV, the type two is not doing any good because there's no wild wires to fight. It's just hanging around and causing harm because all those hundreds of cases of CBDPVs are from this vaccine component that's not doing any good. So it's doing harm by generating cases. The second harm is it lowers the immune response to type one and to type three. There's a competition between the three viruses when they when you give them in the child's gut for some reason. Does that make sense? Uh, so you know you're doing harm in two different ways. No good. So it, and right around that time after the CBDPV outbreaks in mid 2000, the way India uh, eliminated transmission was by taking type two component out. The biggest virus that was circulating wild virus was type one. And so they, and there were modelers that looked at this information, you know, um, Nick Grassley from uh, Imperial College. Uh, it's some groundbreaking stuff, huh? It published in science and, uh, you know, of course, folks in India uh, knew this, Sunil Vail and all. Why don't we just introduce MOPB1 and, you know, so that's when it was used against that specific virus and you saw immune response that was much better and transmission stopped compared to the TOPV that they were using all the time, right? Uh, so that's why I think bivalent uh, made a case for having bipolar getting the type 2 out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So all that, I think, happened in the early 2000s. Uh, it, it, and then, of course, you know, uh, eradication was also getting closer.
But with BOPV, it was felt he would even push it over because we would take type two out. Your immune response might get better. IPV might help that a little bit too. So it all kind of fit. I think timing was good. Timing was good. You could always second guess it, of course. <laughs> well, let's see. There's been a question about, you know, whether there should have been a delay because, uh, you know, I thought this is what you were going to ask about the Syria story. Is it related to the switch? So I think, you know, the flare up, as I was saying, can come from undetected type two circulating vaccine derived poliovirus at the time of the switch. You don't know there's some lurking beneath the pool and your rears his ugly head when the immunity starts dropping. That's what, and which I seems like what happened or it could have been the outbreak was already happening before the just was not detected. And now that we're getting access to those regions in Syria, surveillance is better and we're detecting it, right? Either way, but I think it's not beyond what was predicted. I think more important question is what do we do about it now? How do we stop it? Uh, but I, I think for by all measures, Switch itself was a success in that, you know, we took out that type two, the best possible way we knew how. How uh, did... I, I was hoping you could talk about the two weeks. What you remember of those two weeks? <laughs> April, was it April 7th, Kay? We are on the verge of filling up the cards. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and you also need to leave today. So we will leave off um, just before talking about the two weeks of the actual switch. Correct. And then follow up, mm -hmm. um, including monitoring and validation. Yeah, very important step uh, that unfortunately I did not bring up, but not because it's not important. <laughs> no, that's okay. There's always, always more. Would you consider a second interview at some point in time? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Sounds good. Great. So we'll end for today. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Very uh, much a pleasure to be here.